Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, you're very welcome to, I think, what is now episode 82, I think, of the ProSynth Network live show. Welcome. Um, we are uh, live. It has just gone 7 p.m. here in the UK and uh, 2 p.m. on the East Coast and 11 a.m. on the West Coast. And if you're in Central Europe, it's just gone 8. And um, we must remember... Uh, this weekend the clocks go back here in the UK and in Europe and so things will get a bit squiffy in terms of when we're going live I think for everyone in America we might be an hour later in your day until you guys catch up but we'll we'll make sure you're fully aware of all of those times anyway and um, we've got a cracking show lined up for you lots of uh, juicy little news nuggets to discuss with our guests who I'll come to in just a moment um, hi to everyone that's in the chat room and uh, hi to everyone that's watching on catch up if you didn't manage to get us live we know a lot of you can't because of your geographical locations um, Thank you for joining us and make sure that you hit the the like button just down there somewhere and also the subscribe button that would be really really helpful and if you want to make a donation to the channel uh, you can do that on the YouTube chat through uh, Super Chat and Super Stickers and also um, the PayPal link which again is in the description down below there. Um, so again hello to everyone in the chat room thanks for joining and thank you for contributing if you have any questions for us or for uh, this evening's guest then uh, do make sure you tag us in there and let us know but before we get to our uh, esteemed guest let's uh, cross the Atlantic Ocean looking a little bit fuzzier than normal but he has a good reason for that uh, Chris how are you doing over in California <laughs> yeah doing all right uh, I would not I would like to think of this as not as ro uh, low res but more as like a vintage filter if we can yeah. if we can think yeah. about that yeah yeah, yeah. Chris has been so. filtered I think so. you sound better than you used to it's <laughs> yeah, well, at least I look better you know you're not seeing all the detail yeah it's just Vaseline on the camera isn't yeah. it welcome sir How are you are you well though yeah I'm well Good. yeah glad to hear it and um, the other uh, booming voice that you heard there was our <laughs> Our esteemed leader, Mr. Ben oh, Simpson, leader. Hello, with uh, with his father Christmas look burgeoning there, yeah. and growing, yeah, yes. getting better. Yes, yes. How, are you How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Good, good. Yeah, uh, I've been making videos disastrously, so uh, I need to put a <laughs> yeah. bit more work into that. <laughs> but I have been trying to make a video. My technical skills are just crap. Uh, Image quality is great. Cropping, not so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, but the people in the chat room and watching don't know what happened, but I, I actually filmed myself for half an hour with my head cut off. So you've got <laughs> <laughs> you've got the bottom you've got the bottom of my beard poking out for the full half hour. So, Fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to have to uh, work yeah. on that. Yeah. Subscribe to the channel to watch that one on the outtake <laughs> blooper reel. Something yeah. like that. Anyway, good to have you, yeah. Ben. And, of course, um, we are joined, as we are always are uh, these days, by uh, a very esteemed guest. Uh, this gentleman joined us uh, nearly 18 months ago. He was, I think he was one of our first kind of major guests that had, you know, uh, 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 an elaborate, established career already marked out in front of them and, uh, you know, shared his... Uh, knowledge and experience and tales but the problem we had back then was that we were just a you know a fledgling show and we didn't have any of the wonderful uh, accoutrements that we're, we're used to today and um, his uh, broadband connection was a little bit um, lacking shall we say that has been fixed on both sides joining us from sunny Scotland or wet Scotland and quite what it is at the moment is Mr Mick McNeil 
Ah, hello. Ah, hello. Moving. It's, it's, it's in, in very, full very wet. Can you see me in my... F- <laughs> don't start that. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> well, like, when, we, when, when Chris came on there and said his looked rather kind of hazy, I just immediately thought it was like the old VHS style. Yeah. Until, <laughs> until Rob, you said that it was... Um, uh, what was it on the on the lens again? Vaseline on the lens. Vaseline on the lens, and I thought oh, Renault yeah. really looks like a porno now. <laughs> 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 uh, so anyway, um, how are you? It's been yeah. such a long while. But it's been ages, isn't it? You know, it, it really feels like it was it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. really good. Yeah, really good. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, thank you ever so much for coming back. Um, yeah, pleasure. We're, we're, we're always happy when, when our guests want to come back and. Thank you, and we'll be just like well, we've got some stuff that we want to ask you. I think we're going to get some sort of performances out of you later on because you've uh, we did we did a test with Mick. Um, when was it? Uh, Tuesday or Wednesday? Yeah. And um, yeah, just yeah. to make sure everything was working fine. And then we just sat here and listened to Mick playing on the keyboard. It was just brilliant. Mm. So yeah. we're really looking forward to that. It's a special treat for everyone. If you're a Simple Minds fan, please do stick around. But if you're a music fan, this is just it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. Well, I was really hoping just to course. demonstrate the quality that now we're all up running with because the quality of audio that I'll look back at this again and check. Does this really sound as good as I think it does to me? So that's yeah. really yeah. what I want to try and demonstrate. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It sounded um, great to me. It did, yeah. Uh, can I just also say a quick thank you to Adamski? Um, really enjoyed you on Dom's show on Sunday, which um, I was very lucky to come and be a part of because there was some connection issues. So I, I helped Dom out along with Kent, um, and it was just great to to hear what Adamski is up to in terms of his synthesizer development. If you haven't checked out his channel, please do go and see it. Um, he's doing some wonderful things with his uh, analog synthesizers. So thank you very much for your five pound donation it is much appreciated um let's well let's kick off i suppose with a few news topics before we then uh sort of come to mick um we we lightly touched i think on this one last week with axel um it's kind of i don't want to spend huge amounts of time on it because um i think everybody knows that it's out there and it's in the wild it's logic pro 10.7 uh, which is now updated to come with a free cheese grater. <laughs> um, no, but it comes with uh, spatial audio plugins built in now as standard. Uh, so this is going to allow people to produce their own spatial audio Dolby Atmos mixes because Apple Music recently adopted um, Dolby Atmos as its spatial audio uh, algorithm or codec or whatever you want to call it and so now we as mere mortals can start producing our own music in multi-channel surround sound which i think is is long overdue um hands up who's who's a logic user here uh, on the show uh, ben you don't i know chris does mick have you ever dabbled uh, with logic i did very very early early days but uh, I mean, I don't even think they had MIDI at that point, or I had audio <laughs> right. rather. It was, yeah, yeah. It, it was pre they introduced MIDI into these recording things, but no, no, I, I've never really got got off on it at all. Sure, sure. I, I'm I'm similar. I've got it, but I, I very rarely use it. Uh, but I think like a lot of people that I, I want to work with, they use it. So I am going yeah. to have to get the hang <laughs> of it at some point. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I moved it's to it. Just about not, it's, it's just not as easy as Cubase for me. It's just. It's I think, well, it's horses for courses. I think with with your digital audio workstations, there's the one that fits your the way your brain works, isn't there? And I yeah. I don't I, I don't get on with Ableton Live. I just yeah. I, I get I understand yeah. what it does and how good it is, but when I try and make music with it, I, I just I'm always stumbling over it and just like no, that's not how I wanted it to do. Mm. But yeah. Logic is. I've, I moved to Logic a couple of years ago from Reason because I was producing content that needed to be sent to other people and they needed it in, in a Logic format. So that's I kind of I was forced to do it. Yeah, um, it's so common, isn't it? Everybody, yeah. Everyone's using it. But, I, so, I, was so, I was so long in Pro Tools that I thought I'd never get off it. I, I mean, right. I was <laughs> way back with sound design and sound tools. But I've recently, well, two years ago, changed on to Reaper and I, yeah. I totally love it. Yeah, mm-hmm. again, that's another. That's one that's really. I mean, again, I have that on my system. Um, again, because people will send stuff and they'll they'll send it in a Reaper format. So it's it's Never really tried. interesting. Yeah. But um, mm-hmm. Logic, if we come back to to this, um, yeah, I mean, it is a great great tool. And if you have a Mac and and this is your thing, um, ten point seven is just going to give you some extra uh, features, particularly with 
the whole uh, Dolby Atmos thing because I think finally we might have um, a big market for multi-channel audio and delivering that in a way that everybody can benefit because up until recently if you wanted to experience multi-channel audio you had to have a multi-channel speaker setup and that generally involved a big room lots of speakers lots of cables a lot of money and nobody could actually decide on a common delivery format so you had dvd audio super audio cd you had blu-ray uh, you had dvd video which was compressed and then there were some digital formats and nobody could you know nobody got together and said look we're all going to stick to this one now Apple come in this year and release uh, spatial audio, which uses a special algorithm that simulates multi-channel audio through just a regular pair of stereo headphones. Again, nothing particularly new. Uh, I remember watching a Tomorrow's World episode back in the 80s, I think it was, with Roland yeah. uh, Space Sound, wasn't it? RSS. Yeah. And it was just using very clever mathematical delays to you know, fool your brain into thinking that sound was coming from you know a 360 degree kind of soundscape, uh. but now Apple have adopted it in iTunes or Apple Music, sorry, as it is now, which is you know clearly one of the biggest streaming and uh, purchase platforms, digital purchase platforms on the planet. It's surely got to take off now. Um, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, Mick. I mean, we were speaking before the show about you know what Simple Minds uh, reissues have come out recently in five point one. There's been three or four of them uh, over the recent years. But uh, as yeah. a musician yourself, as a producer, and has have you ever wanted to explore that kind um, of thing? Only the only thing that would really get me going with that would be to be in a a full size cinema. And mm. mix a track for the movie and, and, and surround sound and be in the space. Yeah, I, I'd absolutely love to do that. But I remember years ago, Steve Hillage had this thing. It was a recording. I can't even remember who it was. It the, the microphones were designed with a pair of headphones and the, the speakers were in each ear. Yeah, and it, it was yeah. a matchbox. Did anybody ever hear that? It was a wee a box of matches yeah. that shook around your head and, it was, and you heard it all going all over the place. That totally blew me away. Yeah, it's binaural, isn't it? Um, when you yeah. have two microphones uh, in the same, you know, like in the you know, distance apart as your ears, and then you record those on mono channels, and when you play it back through the headphones, it basically replicates what's just been recorded. Is that what it, it was? I yeah, know. it's dead clever. And the, you can, I actually read an article. There's a guy called Steve Marshall down in the West Country of England who produced an album called By Location, which is out of print now, but it was a full binaural piece where he'd gone round... Um, some of the, you know, because uh, it was down in the West Country, he went around some of the um, the stone monuments, bit, you know, like Stonehenge and Avebury and all of that kind of stuff, yeah. and recorded sounds within those spaces with these binaural microphones and then mixed it with ambient music. And, and it was just mind-blowing. And he did a piece where he was on the top of a hotel and a police helicopter flies over. And you're sat there and you just think... You know, you yeah. can hear this this thing just moving around in, in this three-dimensional space. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, no, I love it. I went to see June the other night, you know, that one. Oh, yes. Hands up. Have you seen that? Not yet, no. No, and I mean, the first couple of minutes, you're thinking, this is going to be great, but it does yeah. go on a bit. I, mean, I fell asleep in the middle of the movie, <laughs> and I woke up, I don't know how long later, but I never missed a thing. But I still, re I still really enjoyed it. It was. Yeah. You can see that the sound has got a big part to play on it. Yes, absolutely. One of the interesting applications for it is uh with uh, i think spitfire audio has uh done some binaural sampling projects so mm. if you can imagine you know one of the things about like playing a piano is the uh, acoustic experience of sitting next to it where the sound is coming out and the phase relationship of all that and they've done some where they've used that binaural microphone head mm -hmm. to capture piano sounds so i can imagine like if you're in a uh a restricted volume environment and you want to play piano instead of just hearing piano samples from a microphone but to feel like you're sitting in front of a piano that that's a really interesting way to do it as well yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. um do you remember was it last week we spoke about uh, acoustic samples v horns um that brass yeah, package yeah. yeah so one of the things that you can do with that is position the horn uh that's playing in one of uh 21 different positions uh, as it would be in maybe uh, an orchestra. So you can then just kind of choose the seat that that instrument's playing at. But also you can change the microphone, and one of the microphones is a binaural head, 
with uh, two microphones at each ear. So you can then recreate the binaural effect in the plugin itself, which is quite cool. So oh, yeah, yeah so I, I really like this. Uh, so you can, only, can you only do the spatial audio effect on headphones? So no, uh, Dolby Atmos is the kind of the, the main codec and Dolby Atmos yeah. is a new iteration of what used to be Dolby Digital 5.1 then became Dolby uh, True HD, which was the uh, 7.1 system. Yeah. So Dolby Atmos adds uh, height. So a regular 5.1 system has a center channel that in cinema generally locks the, uh, the, the narration and the spoken word to the screen. Then you have a uh, stereo left and right at the front, and then you have two at the back, which are again uh, left and right. And so you can then place the audio at different levels to give you that kind of three dimensional space. Yeah. With Dolby Atmos, you're now getting um, other speakers above the listening position, and yeah. in some cases down below as well. So you, you're now kind of, rather than just kind of going around, you can also go up and down and anywhere in between. So it's more of an immersive experience. Yeah. With spatial audio on Apple Music, it uses a uh, an algorithm to recreate that using two speakers. In, I guess in a similar way to what RSS was doing, with, you know, with the rolling gear, with different um, yeah. delays that fool the brain into thinking that there's actually more speakers kind of going on and yeah, placing it in distance yeah. or nearby. And also so. equalization as well. Yeah. So changing the phase relationship and the EQ will give your brain the signal because after all, we are still binaural. We're not, hear we're not hearing it with seven speakers. So exactly. it's kind of a clever mm -hmm. thing that the digital technology is caught up for us to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, a lot of the arguments against this tend to be, oh, well, we, we listen in stereo, but we don't. We have two ears, but we don't listen mm -hmm. in stereo. We listen mm -hmm. in 360 degrees or you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, in this three-dimensional space. And our ears uh, are designed to pick out exactly where a sound is in the three-dimensional space. Uh, and so I actually think this is a lot more natural. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Some of the... Some of the um, uh, the spatial audio mixes that Apple have been putting out are better than others. Um, some are not so good. There are yeah. some that have been translated from pre-existing 5.1 mixes. I'm actually going to, well, while we do the show, I'm going to check to see uh, whether the Simple Mind stuff, because Simple Mind, there was uh, New Gold Dream, Sparkling the Rain. Um, uh, there was a couple of others that were done in 5.1. And they're brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant in 5.1 because you get the, the better separation uh, and okay. kind of the size. Um, did, they have, so, did they have somebody else totally remix them or something? Yeah, How they were re they so that? they they got the the, the masters and were right. able to then place <clears throat> each instrument and each vocal or whatever in that kind of three dimensional space. Um, oh, so what, it worked really well. Of that. What have oh. they done with Mick there? Then has he got like all his keyboards the, together this, in one spot? Where did, where did, they, yeah, where did they put me? <laughs> Is that right. up there? Right back. <laughs> <laughs> it's no it's, it's it is really good stuff um i i, I highly recommend going if you uh the, the super deluxe edition box yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I, you, you, it. I can't I, believe that they haven't sent you these it's just yeah, amazing they don't send me nothing but I, i've always been really flagging up for stereo any any mention of mono or all these things that you do and somebody says i oh, still could just use one mic and i'm like no no it's, ever there was one moment in time where i realized i first heard stereo it was a, a jupiter 4 and mm -hmm. it had a wee button, an ensemble button at the front. You just press this ensemble button, and everything just went really wide. It was yeah. like, wow, what, this is amazing. It was really the first time I actually realised, even yeah. though I'd had a John, uh, what's his name, Mike Oldfield record, you know, from Jubilee Bells, and it was always something would come out that year and something would come out that year. And if you're coming out of well, that speaker, I never even had headphones at the time, but that was all, that wasn't really stereo. That's just that one coming out there in mono, and that one's coming out there in mono. Yeah. But no, the, the ensemble button on the Jupiter 4 kind of was groundbreaking for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything that kind of gives sound a kind of bigger dimension is is, is always mm -hmm. good. Um, yeah. Some of the other things that uh, Logic Pro has added, I mean, obviously, we've got things like live loops that were in there from the last version, little tweaks and performances. I think probably the, the worst thing about this for me is that I, I can no longer, with my current Mac, use this version of, of Logic because you now have to have uh, Big Sur or Monterey uh, to, to run this and my, my Mac will not run those operating systems. It's a little too long in the tooth now. So 
yep, it's going to force yeah. me next year to go out and buy a new piece of hardware. That's but, a donut, darn. isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it, again, it is in some ways. Um, but considering this, this Mac is nearly 10 years old and I've not had to do anything with it and it's, it's got, got me 10 years down the line and it's only now that I'm having to think, well, now you know, if I want to keep up, I've got to buy something else. Yeah. Um, it's I, I think that's pretty good value for money. I think we, yeah. I mean, I it's cost me 150 pounds a year for 10 years. Yeah, um, that's when this, we're looking at it. Which is yeah, it's not when you think about my PC. I was changing it or doing something to it like every two or three years just to mm. kind of keep up with the Joneses thing. But uh, anyway, um, well, yeah, if with... you're working off that model, my laptops cost me a thousand pound a year because it's coming up to the point of needing <laughs> needing replacing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one thing I'll say about this Logic update is that for those that are not interested in the spatial audio, because that's gotten a lot of the attention of it, and for good reason, uh, but it still is a great update that contains a lot of uh, under the hood stuff and also some really great stuff with MIDI implementation and mm -hmm. also the sequencer um, has gotten some really great updates. So if you're a Logic user and you're not interested in spatial audio, it's definitely worth checking out everything else that's going on with it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I might have updated mine and not known. Right. You know, just like click that update thing and then never bothered loading it. To, that to wouldn't surprise me. That wouldn't surprise yeah. me. Downloads it but yeah. never uses it. <laughs> anyway. Um, so there you go. That's Logic Pro 10.7 out now. And if you already have Logic, it's a free upgrade. Um, I, I'm dreading you know, when Logic 11 eventually drops because they'll probably have to put my hand in my pocket then. But uh, there you go. Another piece of news that dropped um, last week but we didn't really go into uh, that I want to uh, just cover here. And this is something that our guest Mick, I think, might be interested in. Mm -hmm. And this is, he says, if I can just bring up the right tab i'm working a slightly different system here so hopefully this is all going to work really really cool well, um for a second it sounded like you were working really hard because oh, ben was yeah. typing and, and you're, <laughs> so if i can get this up and it sounds yeah. like you're doing stuff like mad that's it yeah. sorry so, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just filling in my tax return <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this uh, is the news that Spectrasonics, um, yeah. they teased us a little bit last week, and then they dropped these things called Sonic Extensions, and basically it's four new instrument libraries uh, that work on the Omnisphere platform, so you do need Omnisphere already to, to use these. Yeah, it was um, Annihilated Sky, I, I saw that demo where yeah. it, so it was really quite amazing actually. It really is nice. Uh, so yeah, you've got Nylon yeah. Sky, you've got Unclean Machine, uh, you've got seismic shock, and then there was a fourth one. There it goes, undercurrent. Um, so each of these has a, a specific uh, kind of task or genre, and each instrument has a number of features and functions. Uh, so you can have scenes, you can add color to the sounds, you can uh, change mic positions and all that kind of thing. It doesn't seem to be things that haven't been done already before by other That's people. Yeah, or even by Omnisphere itself. I mean, there's yeah. so many things in Omnisphere. It creates all these big... I'll, I'll play a couple for you that I think sound exactly what that does. But yeah. as, as soon as I saw Eric do the demo of that, the first thing I wanted to do was go online and buy it. Yeah. But mm. he's got a way of do, selling stuff. That he's, <laughs> oh, he's, yeah. a, he's amazing. He just goes a few moves and it sounds like some amazing player. Well, he is an amazing player, but... Well, yes, yeah. that's the thing. He's, he, uh, he's a great salesman as well, though, isn't he? Because yeah. you are, like, totally captivated by his presentation. And, and I know, yeah, and everything's just... super, super duper. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <It's> like... yeah. <laughs> um, let's see if we get some demos in this example here. Um, let's just do this. There we go. Oh, we can't hear him. Yeah, you can't no, hear it. Oh, no. No. Idea. no. Oh, this is, so this is my... Uh, my plans have gone completely awry already. I thought I'd cleared everything here to work. Uh, let's do this. Uh, right. Hang on. Phil for me, guys. Uh, <laughs> Nylon Clouds. It was really appropriately named when it goes in. I watched that one. That was pretty amazing. Right. I'm going to bet this probably won't work. Try again. Anything? No. 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 Uh, right. Okay. Well, let, let me try and, and fix yeah. that uh, <laughs> while we do that. Um, 
Can we, well, so we yes. put his face talking in one of our boxes so it looks like yeah, he's hanging yeah. out with us? I'll, I'll, I'll do the voiceover. <laughs> Mick can do the demo. Yeah, yeah well, well, I'll, do, I'll do a demo of the Spectrasonic <laughs> stuff right here. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got it right there. Not, not the, the thingy yeah. one, but, you know, this Keyscape, which, I mean, I, I love yeah. the Spectrasonic stuff. I love the the trillion bass and again Eric does this amazing demo of the of the bass guitar as well but this looks familiar to me even though they've named it the electronic grand I, I would see it as a CP70 you know which yeah, was yeah. My, which my, my old toy and that was one of the key features for a, well a, quite, you know, a famous song let me put this click this onto my microphone one more time it would be this That sounds familiar. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> Things like a hat. Yeah, that yeah, that that could get in the charts, I think. Oh, I was... On the bass sounds of business. Yeah. Well, that'd be the deal. I'll come back onto this one in a minute. Uh, oh. That's the sort of. We're, we're just saying, yeah, you carry on. Just do two hours. <laughs> that, mate. We'll just sit okay, here. Well, well that, I mean, that, I loved that, but there's no much more you can do with that one. The other one that I really loved was the. Um, it's, well, it's like a Rhodes kind of thing, you know, it's like mm. a Fender sort of Rhodes. That's why I've clicked it. Now, even though I, I'm I'm kind of old school with with the seventies and music like that, so that's why I'm, I'm I would sit and play this all day. Like, go <laughs> even slower. It's almost like the, the Nyland Echo. I'm going to jump the octave because the plastic's too... <laughs> at the octave. I, I love it. Very nice, it really is. A key change, of course. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea with that, don't you? Beautiful stuff, lovely. Hey, I, I, Beautiful. I got two things to say about that. <laughs> number <laughs> one, <laughs> number one, okay. you need you need a YouTube channel where you play all all this stuff, and we can put it on our headphones as we go to sleep and yeah. just relax, <laughs> yeah. clear out the day. Yeah, the both the sound and the playing there, <laughs> and, and I'm kind of with you though. <laughs> The second thing is like, you know, you're talking about like, well, the 70s sounds, I, I love a lot of those 70s sounds, but sometimes they weren't recorded as well, or um, some of the sensibilities about how we EQ things were, or not, were not the same. And I, I love hearing some of those classic instruments like the Rhodes, uh, but then when you put that ambient reverb on there, it just the way that the, what it does to the stereo feel, it's like, it's a very familiar sound, but all of a sudden it's so yeah. much bigger now. Yeah. That's exactly what gets me going in it, the whole wideness of it in the space. That's what makes me want to go down and get that nylon guitar, that cloud thing it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a slightly different one because this is the old Nord. But again, for such a, I mean, if this is the only surviving keyboard from my past, even though I didn't have this when I was in the band, I'd have loved to have had it. But this is a sort of thing that it was a, a B-side or something. It was called Brass Band in Africa. And it's just these notes, there are two notes, I'll put, I'll put that on the, onto the other um, cam. 
It's just two notes at a time. I'll, I'll filter it up a bit. And it just creates a, a sort of mood. Other keyboard up this on here, I've no I have. Aye. This is another piano sound. Beautiful. Something like that. Does that sound any good? Awesome. Is, mm. Yeah. I, I was just like, yeah, you can carry on. You can carry Are we on. in stereo still? Yes. Yeah. A lot of people <laughs> actually commenting on 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 the stereo effect there as well. Um, lots of great. I mean, honestly, some people said, "Does where was it?" Uh, try and find this comment. That's gone. There's loads of comments coming in. Somebody said you should be in a band. <laughs> Um, yeah, should. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of that's kind of what I'm into the moment. I just kind of sit and go through some of these sounds, and they're mm. so inspiring just to sit and float away and stuff. And I, I totally love it. I'm, yeah. I'm playing it all for myself now. I'm not trying to sort of sell something or, or be a commercial or write a song or try try and yeah. catch up with anything at all. It's just it's a whole mood thing for me at the moment. Yeah, well, you love it. Yeah. You should. I think you should put an album together of that stuff. I think yeah. so. Somebody yeah. actually asked in the chat, and I can't remember uh, who it was. I think it was Angel Sonoro. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, could you please make – this is directed to you, uh, Mick. Could you please make tutorials to teach uh, anything about the tracks you were involved in, how to play oh, yeah. them or how to get your amazing sounds? You would make many people happy, and I think uh, I'd subscribe to that. 
Yeah, that'd be For an sure. interesting one. I mean, I'd probably yeah. have to go back and find that old Jupiter 4 with the ensemble button. Well, that was that was <laughs> another question, I think. Um, whilst we're here, we might as well go through them. Somebody asked uh, something like, yeah, uh, here we go. Ryan Mitchell says, what happened to your OBXA, oh, yeah. your JP4, and what... Do you uh, still have any of that stuff? Or? I, I, I carried them about for so long and moved them between house and house and building studios and I would always get a rack of all this stuff that I thought I liked, but it was just, I wasn't ever using it. And then the, the, the rack mount, mounted versions of stuff came out, you know, these racks yeah. of Roland and Yamaha's and they kind of washed all over them and then the soft sense came out and then I still had all the sense and then I had the racks and then I had the soft sense. I'm like, oh, for <laughs> God's sake. It's just yeah. like a, a music shop in here. <laughs> Eventually, I, put, I, got my, I got my son, uh, my second oldest boy, to kind of do a, a wee project, see what you can get on, on eBay for this slot. And I, there was a Rhodes, there was a Hammond, there was a CP70. It was, oh, there was a whole load of stuff and there was some pretty good rack gear, actually. There was a MKS-80 with the controller, which I remember that was, I, I should have kept that one. But this guy got in touch for Yorkshire or something, says, so I'll, I'll take the lot. <laughs> and he, came, he drove up the next day in a van and just bought the lot. Wow, lucky man. Lucky, lucky man. Um, there was another question here somewhere from... But I must Dan admit, th this thing here, having to... Uh, uh, this just covered everything. The only thing yeah. wrong with this is just no enough keys on it, you know, plus a kind of plastic <laughs> bit. Even though the later versions, I'm sure they, they built better yeah. weighted keys and all that. But it's just so powerful. I mean, even messing with the filter there, you know, it's just so... Like, I, mean, I could just go with that all night. Yeah. Well, Adam uh, was uh, asking, how do you get inspired to start your melodies or do you just, like, riff away until something kind of fits? Or Yeah, I mean, I think everything sort of just depends. As in the sound, that was another thing. When I saw the OBX there. It was actually Steve Hillage's girlfriend, Maquette, was actually in Gong with the band, I think. She was the first person I saw that had a, an OBX, and it was the hold button. The fact that you could just do that and, and hit a hold, hold button on that and yeah. let that run, I mean, and then away you go and start doing stuff, it, that would suggest what, what the tones would be like and what kind of, where the melody would go and stuff like that. And I, I, that also freed up my hand, because normally all this stuff, I'd be stuck with my hand when I know it yeah. and have to do, do that. So the hold button along with the ensemble button yeah, <laughs> they're all key bits, and at the moment I'm I'm kind of looking at the the modular gear. I don't know if you can see that. Well, you can't see that if I can turn that around a bit. You can really see some of that. There we go. Can, can you see the rack? Yeah, just about. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's what I'm kind of looking at at the moment. You know, and I would. Yeah. Well, I'll put the rack on the input. I'll just let you hear. What I, I don't know what's going to be running on that, but that, that's what's running. Oh yeah. That's a wee filter there. That's running. This is actually a Glasgow company in Strua, and they've got some really cool, really cool, uh, um, what do you call them? Modules. Modules. Yeah. Uh, there's that one there. Better there. And that's the Strua one there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, I need I need more stuff to be honest. With you. <laughs> Even though I don't know why, why, why any of this actually works, but I, whatever it is, I just need more of that. <laughs> he's, he's, been bitten. he's I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can see this module here. Let me, let me stop that a minute. This module here at the end. This this is actually my favourite. I need a wee toothpick to pull that out. Yeah, it's just a wee bit of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's how you and, space. And, and you can never change the volume of it. You're always <laughs> fixed to that. I've got to keep bending it here and then to just make it fit in there, but it just fits there perfectly. Well, actually, I, I cut it out to size. <laughs> but, you know, so you you stick something like that on, and I, I don't even know what that was, but that would be like... And you could run something in the back, well, I don't know. And away you go, you know, that'd be the start of uh, the next yeah. five hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'd become half past three in the morning. I'd be seeing daylight coming in through the, the, the window, and I think, "Oh shit, the kids will be getting up for school in a minute." <laughs> and I'm, I'm still holding a note. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It sounds saying, familiar, it's, that, and I, I, I didn't yeah. quite a lot of that. The the thing with you know holding a note, um, 
that to me suggests a kind of a, a linkage to traditional Scottish music with Definitely, the bagpipes yeah. Absolutely, and that that's... drone. And is that is that yeah. kind of the thing? I mean, that's exactly the thing, Rob. That's exactly yeah. what it was. So a lot of the stuff for Simple Minds was based on the, for me anyway. Yeah, was, because that's all I knew. You know, my, my main instrument was an accordion, and all the, all the, all the, my brothers and sisters all played traditional instruments, and so. Yeah. Pipes and, and accordions and all that stuff was predominantly running right through my life. Yeah, e we, we even, yeah. Sorry, I was to say we spoke about it the other day, uh, and then, you know the, the Scottish influence in your work with, say, Simple Minds, and also yeah. other Scottish bands of the time, ha you know, really brought that to the fore and made it a really big thing. And it was, yeah, it was really like special. Big country, I mean, yeah, big yeah. country. Stuart Adamson had a really knack of kind of tuning into what, what the Scottish sound was with it kind of guitar sounded like bagpipes yeah, as well anyway amazing. it was the most, most guitar yeah. bagpipe sound I've ever heard yeah you say you, uh, sorry sorry Mick you also said the other night that uh, some accordion techniques yeah yeah came through into the Simple Mind songs and New Gold Dream in particular that, that, that's right that, well yeah. yeah I'll show you what I mean with that I mean I, I did a thing recently with a wee guy up in Shetland and I, and I looked at that, and I just need a kind of straight sound in there. You like that? Can you see my yeah. finger? Yeah. So that, there, would be, there, was, there is a wee tune. That was, that's called Paddy's Leather Breaches. I went looking for that on iTunes. <laughs> did, did you? Did you find that? Did I couldn't remember it? what it was called. I thought it was called Paddy Wears Your Trousers. <laughs> well, it is, that's exactly that as a translation. <laughs> I think it's Irish, actually. But Paddy's but, Leather Breaches, yeah. But also, after I, after I did that, you know, see, obviously it's an extension of that because it's going... It's, it's some of the accordion players do all the time run of them. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? I tried yeah. to play, play that. But I also remember there was another track called um, This Earth That You Walk Upon. I don't know if you know that one. That was kind of, that was all about the same time and it was on, right. I think it was on New Gold Dream or something. Yeah. All around about the same time. It's just that kind of, the kind of thing I would do naturally when I'm searching for what, what am I going to do. Like yeah. when, the band would all fire in, you get the bass and drums playing something, Charlie would start messing with the guitar and looking for chords, they'd be looking for pads or backing, and you don't know what you're going to do, but one of the things you've got to do is get in early. <laughs> because, <Yeah. you> know, <laughs> yeah. because once all these parts start making form and you start listening yeah. over and over again, you're trying to squeeze into your space now. Yeah, you, instead yeah. of you've got to create the space that let yeah. them squeeze into my space. Well, your yours and Charlie's uh, parts in the songs are, are very intricate together, aren't they? I, I've. Uh, before yeah. I knew what I was on about, like I, I could hardly tell what was guitar and what was guitar. Well, well, neither, neither yeah. could I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was mainly because Charlie was into effects just as much as I was yeah. With, yeah. with echo yeah. units and electro harmonics, flangers and phasers. In fact, I, I recall having a crybaby on my accordion when to try and get the yeah. thing that was on my accordion. As if it wasn't, as if it wasn't the trebly enough. I've yeah. got this screeching. <laughs> it's cut your face off, basically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, imagine that, a screaming treble accordion with, and adding more treble to it. And Charlie, I, I remember when I first joined the band, I had a wee MXR phaser and I'd plug it into yeah. the piano. That's the other thing about pianos as well. When, especially when you see things like the keyscape and the first piano sound that I'd ever heard was on a, I think I bought the instrument as soon as I heard it. It was the Emulator 2. Mm -hmm. And it, it was probably 8-bit or something like that, but because it actually sounded like a recording of a piano, I just had to have this thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't even a piano player, really. I, I, I was kind of just still really basic synthy stuff. And then I heard the Kurzweil 250 that had came out shortly afterwards, and it was like, my God, that's like a, the best piano I've ever heard in my life. And plus all the other things that came into the Kurzweil 250, there was the strings and mm. the timpanies and the percussion. It suddenly was a total uh, game changer as far as trying to imagine that, well, 
real authentic instruments, we can incorporate this into songwriting and into tunes that we do. And yeah. the, the gear has always steered me creatively. Of you know, sitting with the accordion, it's, it's all very well, and I'm doing that now actually. But but you, I, I need stimulation from sound. I need I, I need to be inspired by all of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, going going back to uh, your relationship with Charlie for a moment. Uh, you know, it, it's been commented in the chat, and you know, we've been talking about how great the interplay was between the two of you. Yeah, on an interpersonal level in the band, because I mean that that's the thing is like you can have two great players, but if they're both trying to dominate a space, yeah, standing and, on and each of course other's the person toes, the keyboards. Yeah. yeah, really fit yeah. in that same space. What was the secret to you guys working this stuff out so that yeah. you were working for the song and not trying to work that for is, yourself? Well, that's a really good question, Chris, because a lot of the times it was kind of luck because, I mean, as I was saying, I liked my effects. Charlie loved his effects. By the time we got all, all the audio processed, it, it was hard to tell what was a keyboard and what was a guitar, never mind what the parts were. I think the, the fact that a guitar, the way it's strung and the way Charlie would pick out certain notes, they would be different from the way I would go straight for a, a, a basic a, a first inversion or second inversion of a chord. His mm -hmm. would be much, much wider. So automatically the default of whatever came out of those instruments was going to be different. The thing that kind of confused it the most was the fact that we were both heavily processed and we were using similar effects, whether it be yeah. flangers or delays or reverbs or... We try to affect everything. And the other reason for that would be because a lot of the stuff we had, it was kind of, you know, you had to try and change the sound somehow. Mm. It alter a wee bit. But as far as differentiating between the parts that we both came up with, I really think it was just luck. I really think mm. we just kind of, we just locked in and, and it kind of just worked. You know, so we never actually consciously came out and said, wait a minute, you sound a bit too much like me, or I sound a bit too much like you. It was almost like it just kind of fell together quite naturally. Yeah. But I, I, you know, honestly, I think you're you're underplaying it a bit as far as <laughs> the kind of talent, and then also the generosity of spirit. Like when you work with a musician, and and maybe this is where a lot of uh, people making music by themselves at home kind of miss out that kind of lesson of. Um, you know, like you, you were talking specifically about like, you know, changing chord inversions and where, uh, you know, like in bands that I've been either with another guitar player or, or with a, a keyboard player, like you kind of learn the other person like, oh, they're going low. So I'm going to stay up a little bit higher or vice yeah. versa. And that's kind of an important thing. And I think uh, musicians at home can, if you, if they think about in the recording, if they're doing a, a part over here or this kind of inversion or you know, this kind of tone to what's going to accent it and make it work together. And I think that's what you guys intuitively did so well. Mm. Yeah, well, that's what I, that, thanks very much for that, Chris. But I, I really didn't feel it was it was calculated in, in such a way that mm. we'd even think you're high and I'm low, even though that can, may have came naturally. But things like... Most bands of the we were coming at the back of the seventies. Okay, the punk thing aside, if you park that, basically the history of the the thing that we were doing always had a guitar solo in the middle, or somebody here comes the keyboard solo, and both Charlie and I were we really they hated the idea of just the guitar solo and having to do a solo. It, it felt like the the, the norm. We were trying to avoid the norm. So even though we we we. We've consciously avoided trying to put the obvious things in there. It just kind of fell together really quite naturally. Yeah, worked. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> really worked. So, uh, um, yeah, that's oh, it's just fantastic stuff. I love hearing all this. Um, mm. Let's just. Uh, I'm uh, what I'm trying to do at the moment is figure out why you you guys are not hearing uh, audio. Mm. So I'm going to try something here because. Uh, Mick, you mentioned the Kurzweil K250, and yeah. it just so happens that a video came to light this week. It's been out for for a while now, but this is a guy playing the the K250, and right. it sounds amazing. It's Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, which you know, typically is not the music of choice here. I hope you can hear this. Please tell me uh, if you can. So let's just start this off here. Uh, I'll zoom up to this bit here. Right, please tell me you can hear this. Anything? No. Is it, is it muted? Don't, is, have you got to no. muted on it? Speaker? Oh. No. 
it's it's the browser. Well, you know, that's uh, the keyboard. That's the boy. That's the boy yeah. right there. It's, it was beautiful. I loved that. I'm going to try and fix. A, yeah, fix. Sorry, the audio uh, we've had a couple of questions in the chat that I yeah, could, go for I it. could put to Mick if that's okay, Mick. Yeah, yeah, go for uh, it. Uh, Mr. Wiggly, which is Dom, a good friend of ours, he said, uh, "What does Mick think of the new SP404?" And also. <laughs> Do you have any tips on making FM synth sound better? I think that's a bit of a dig at someone in here, that. That's shocking. Okay. That's shocking stuff. How to make FM, how to make FM synth sound better would be, I, I take it you're talking about the old DX7 sort of stuff. Yeah, I go could, on, get it over with. Go on. Yeah, I, don't, I would... I mean, I, I, again, that was I, I, I dabbled and tried to edit one of those things early, early doors, and that, I, I got big raised eyebrows all the time, like even for myself. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> where did that come from? And suddenly, you, it's well, like one of those things when you think, I, "Oh, this is getting good. This is getting, this is getting," and then yeah, I'm losing it, I'm losing it, and it is gone. You know, you're like, <laughs> how do I get that back again? <laughs> no, you forget it. So. Yeah. I, I, I moved on from FM synthesis a long, long time ago. But the other one, you, I don't know what that other one is that you mentioned. The SP404. Yeah. What's the SP404? sampler thing. Yeah. No, nobody knows. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. And I can't. It's not really your cup of tea, that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's uh, Dom, Dom's new little toy. Is a, It's basically yeah. a small little sampling uh, box that you can then just do loops and breaks and, and that kind of thing. But right, I, okay. I, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, uh, Dom's a big fan, me not Sonic so Link in the chat asks if Mick ever used a Prophet 5. No, but funny, that's the sound I've got on that. That's the, 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 it's a Prophet 5 setting that's on the Nord, and a Prophet 5 is something I always wanted. And yeah. because I had the, Ober, the Oberheim, I felt it was a, a bit of an... I mean, the band, the band paid for all my stuff, and Jim used to kind of joke... Mick's going to bankrupt the band if he wants any more gear. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, that K250 was 18,000 quid at the time. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? That was a big investment. But that, that came slightly later because before, it, when I would have bought the Profit 5, we did a tour with Ice House. Remember the band, Australian yeah, band? Ice yeah, House. Yeah. And they had that track, which I still totally love, Great Southern Land. You know the one? Mm -hmm. Do you, have you yep. heard that? And I, I remember, because we did a whole tour and I used to watch that song and, it, and the sound, it was the one note and it was just beautiful. It just covered the whole thing. And I thought, I really want one of these prophets. But no, the nearest we got to sequential circuits was the, the drum machine, which oh, yeah, I loved right. as well. We got yeah. a sequential circuit. I don't know what model it was. It was yeah. one you could detune the tom-toms and do it all in real time. And it, uh, uh, that was, it was a lovely, we did quite a few was things. Was the drum it was the drum tracks. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, yeah. Really right, good. another question. I think you'll like this one, maybe. Uh, this is from Synth Addict. What are your main influences and has anything recent inspired you? Right, okay. Um, I mean, I, I, sh I shoot in and out of stuff, like, like really kind of quite, well, phases out. Right, for example, last week, I couldn't stop playing that song by... Um, what's his name? Um, oh, I can't remember his name again. Do, 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 do. Oh, I can't even remember the song. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, don't I? I was just trying to remember. <laughs> trying to learn it. What, something like that was it again. Anyway, I, it's, a, it's a 70s guy. It's a 70s song. And I just kept playing it and playing it. And I did that kind of slow version of it. I can't think. I've, I've gone blank in my head. Yeah. Uh, but it's something like Bread or something like that. You know, one of these bands that you get, the American kind oh, of West yeah. Coast. Or, yeah. So I, I come in and do that, or, or sometimes I listen to classical music quite a, quite a lot. I just actually I just watched that movie last night. Um, there goes the bloody memory again. It's just on, on Netflix. It's about uh, Joanna Lumley's in it. She's a, a, a music singing teacher. It's oh, really, right. she's hilarious in it, man, yeah. really funny. <laughs> she's teaching this girl how to sing, but there's a lot of classical music in it in the areas. And it's called Figaro, Falling for Figaro. Ah, right. And I, I've, I've done a whole stretch of classical stuff. In fact, my, my musical um, lessons were all pretty much based in classical, Vivaldi's and Strauss and all that. So I, I did do a fair bit of classical in, within my music bringing. Yeah. So I, I would say a lot of that did influence me. For example, this is really weird, I mean, if I was to say, like, Waterfront, you know the track Waterfront? Yeah. And there's a bit on that, like, where is it? Okay. 
I'll just try to get a sound. No, that bit. The, re yeah. I, the reason that, I mean, it sounds all weird in that sound, but... I, I repeated it because I thought, like, a lot of classical stuff, to, it was a kind of stumbling a wee thing, you think, if I did it twice, it'll sound like it's it's more deliberate. Yeah. <laughs> so that was... <laughs> and I found a lot of classical music, they kind of just do the same thing, just double that again immediately, yeah. and it reaffirms it. So I would yeah, have said yeah. that, that's a kind of... I took something like that for classical. Really? But, um so the influences I say, are, I think the, the Scottish element were pretty obvious. Really, there was quite a few things back then, like even the the new gold dream, uh, the alive and kicking thing, where I was going like that. Oh, I need to take some of this. It was a kind of try to do like a peeprock bagpipe thing. When you yeah. play it on the accordion, it kind of makes more sense. It makes more sense than that weird sound that I just put in that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, it just goes all over the place, and it, the only thing that inhibits me really is my own ability, which I think I, I stopped going to music after about seven or eight years, and you kind of reach a point where you think, oh, well, I've got enough to get me by, but then later on in life, you sort of regret you no know, mm -hmm. looking in, but. I think it's no stop me because I still I still understand the importance of playing hardly anything at all and try to keep it to the absolute two fingers and keep it really minimum. Yeah. I, that, that, that's so important to me. And it's so important also to try and express whatever you're playing as much as possible or almost over express it. Having, had I learned more and more, I think I may have just turned into some weird jazz guy and yeah. uh, it would have gone all wrong, you know, jazz right out my mm. face that, that that would have been wrong but I, I prefer it, to play something really nothing -y and simple than that have been fill every note up you know I mean that's what that goes with it so you know yeah saying. I think I think that like a lot of the music that I really love tends to be less you know I think there's yeah. more there's more yeah. in the spaces between the notes than the notes if you know yeah what I mean. The, the song no Miles think, Davis on this Yeah, well, well, Miles Davis actually, Images of Spain blew me away. I listened to that for days, days on end. You know, I was in Madrid at the time and I was smoking, smoking weed and <laughs> Images of Spain. It was just unbelievable, the, the sound that Miles Davis got. Fantastic. But the song I was trying to think of earlier was called If I Could Read Your Mind. You know that one? Who, who was it that sung that again? If I Could Read Your Mind, Love. What a this to be Oh, yeah. yeah. It's an old one, that, isn't it? Yeah, it's a really old one. It was, yeah. I can't remember his name, but I mean, I'll go on to an old song and pick it out. Kind of the way you see somebody like Ricky Gervais pulls an amazing set list together, or Peter Kay, you know, they've got the public tracks for the 70s that mm. are just hit the nail right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, lo um, I love. Guys, can I just pause you there? I'm trying to fix the. <laughs> technical issues at the moment yeah. i've got myself coming back in my ears i'm going to shut down the browser window that i'm using now and i've got another one open and i'm hoping that it will just kind of flip over so <laughs> sure. if it doesn't i will try and come straight back and you should all you should all still be here i'll get practice in there yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right so yeah. I'm, I'm gonna go what? three two one bye <laughs> He's gone okay. right. We have talking I'm about back. water. Uh, yay! It worked. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah, That's quick. It's like a talking time about... warp there, wasn't it? <laughs> so yeah, yeah um, if you can interest. do some more questions, I need to set some other bits up. So yeah, crack. Chris sure. has got one, I think. Yeah. So um, you were talking about waterfront um, just a moment ago about how you were creating the part for it, and uh, Jorge Marino wants to know about how you got the sound of it, that huge stack sound of waterfront, like right. the sound design part of it. So, yeah. yeah, I mean that was a big. I remember at the time, obviously it was a bass line that started. That Derek had bought this thing. I think it was called the Dynacord. And it was a kind of you play a wee bit and you hit the button and the foot and it just loops it. So he just a dun 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 dun, and away thing this thing would go and it just sounded amazing. So he'd just take the bass off. But for <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't quite. He'd actually worked out some other wee lines for it. This wee yeah. thing. In fact, Derek, I would give Derek the credit for that that melody which goes. 
See that wee thing that, that was on that, yeah. that we used as a main melody for that? Yeah. That was kind of Derek that came up for that. You know what I mean? And then it's, he, he was playing that on a harmony on a wow. on his bass on top of the other thing. But Jim, Jim was like, Charlie hit the chord or something and that would hit a chord. I think it was like a... In fact, that sounded actually all right there, didn't it? <laughs> Sounded <Sunny> spot on. <laughs> that would have done the trick at the time. But to, <laughs> to get that on a CP70, I had already sampled the CP70 and I had an Akai at the time, it was an Akai, it was probably an Akai 1000, and I put the whole sample of the keyboard an octave higher, so effectively it would be like that, where I put that up an octave there, it would be like that. I remember that. You know, you get this big bang bang, and Charlie would hit the same chord on the guitar, that sort of suspended D. And that was so okay. We need to get this sound really, really big to get this. So it's like ba dum da da. It was kind of Jim was pushing to get that a bigger sound all the time. Yeah. So there was that, and there was one other thing with the melody. Da, 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 da. And then it was just a case of the arrangement. You know, that was kind of just how can we pad this out without because we're stuck with the D chord for the whole song. You know what I mean? You know, there's no much you can do with it. You're kind of trapped there. So it was, was a case that, of how. Was, was Sorry. that a deliberate thing? Did it, I know Derek came up with it with his his pedal, but was yeah. it a, a, a decision that you all made that we want to write a song that is on one note? Or uh, well, no, it was, it was kind of it kind of couldn't stop it. Once she took the thing out, <laughs> the whole thing died in its arse, didn't it? Like yeah. it's in the basement. Of me, like what happened there? You know. Uh, well, ultimately, I had to to be sure that we knew would because it was quite random the way he would play the dun da dun and where he hit it to get the swing of it. So what we actually did eventually was take the recording off the record and I put it into the emulator and we had it as a trigger on a note. So we knew we were going to get the same thing uh, every time. Right, so we yeah. kind of cheated live with that just yeah. to get the... So we knew that otherwise it was going to be kind of random, unlike with the tracks like um, Love Song, which was a, oh. another Jupiter 4 a sequencer thing yeah. where I'd have to set that up live every single time. Wow. You know, and find out with a thing. It was a kind of awkward one. I, I was trying to get a sound like a machine, and it was yeah. on the random arpeggio. It's just to make this kind of machine industrial sound. Yeah. But to do that, maybe the song before it would be something like Promise You a Miracle or something, which has got a kind of regular sound on it. I'd have to go back, get back, hopefully Jim would talk a wee bit and tell a story or something. Well, I start setting this thing up in the dark to get this this love song start and then Jim would turn around and like, are you ready, Mike? Because he obviously, he's not going to announce the song. <laughs> well, here, yeah. Here's love song and you turn around and I'm fanning a bit with this thing. <laughs> What are you and doing? Try to get a, a head torch. I never even had a head torch. So he'd be sinner. And he wasn't a man of... Uh, I mean, Jim ultimately became amazing with people in, in, a, in an audience. But he wasn't like Peter Gabriel or anything where he would have a whole story about the song or anything. You know, yeah. okay, so so when, when patches and presets came about, that was like, oh my God, this is... Uh, I, I needed this years ago. <laughs> so uh, sorry, I, I drifted off this question there, uh, Ben. What, what was the actual question? <laughs> it was Chris, was it? Was it Chris or was it me? No, no it was you. It was you. Oh, was it? I, I was just getting <laughs> carried away with the conversation, man, forgetting what's going on. But, oh, it was the uh, deliberate decision to keep it oh, in yeah. one note because oh, yeah, yeah. us lot is like aspiring to be like Simple Minds at the time. He was like, whoa, that is genius, that man. We didn't realise it was a... A technical limitation that you were yeah. working with. You know, yeah, that's well, amazing. But it was. Yeah. If you noticed that there was a few things, like there was another one uh, called Celebrate. It was a track mm. called Celebrate in one of the earlier records, and that was a case with no loops because I never really, apart from an arpeggiator, I never really did any any sequence or, or linked up to any click tracks or anything. Yeah. Despite the fact Charlie and I were so stuck on delays and echo speeds. With Charlie did a lot of stuff, we'd bounce off the echo tracks. So we needed the drummer, I mean, Brian was solid right for the start. Yeah. I remember Brian McGee, he's no, he's no such like a technical drummer as such, but he was such a good drummer. 
at keeping time. Yeah. That the echoes always seem to work really good. The only thing that would go wrong would be getting a bit too excited, and then yeah. the things with the audience, you know, mm. and they were like, "Slow down, Brian! Eh? Try to speed up the echoes here." When you're at a time with the echo, it just sounds like a, a it just turns into a world of hurt, <laughs> yeah. That, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So getting to get into the grips, we've been in front of a really vibrant crowd, but stay cool. It took a, it took a lot of years, and it took a lot of tapes. Listening to the last night's gig, to think. I mean, that's, that's Mickey Mouse, man. We're playing way too fast. You're yeah. getting caught up in the euphoria instead of yeah. pull this whole thing back. And there was a couple of examples of pulling it back working really well as we got later on in the career, like a track called Let It All Come Down, yeah. which we, we deliberately put tempo changes in it because a lot of that was actually sequenced on the record just to bring this tempo down and slow it down. And when we got to play that live, you could really feel it getting bigger as yeah. you got slower and you're doing, doing good. Instead of rushing into a chorus, do da 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 and away, it's run away. Slow it down, and by the time you hit the chorus, it was just huge, you know, it was brilliant. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have seen this one, but this, this one interests me. This is Ben uh, from the wonderful Museums website. Um, and he wants to know, he says, uh, Peak Simple Minds for him was Verona. Uh, he was so incredibly jealous of the people on that stage and he still loves that show to this day. Um, what was the experience like for you, Mick? Was it just another uh, gig or was it a no, special show? It was a real special show. I mean, I, I never watched the video. I think I saw the video briefly. I never even watched the whole video all the way through um, after it was all made because it, my memory of the gig was just too good. It was almost like, I mean, obviously it was Italy, it was beautiful, the crowd are just mm. gorgeous, you know. We'd done that street thing. We, we, Lisa, the fiddle, and Charlie and I, we, we intended actually to go busking on that tour, every show that we could, or as much as possible. I mean, it just got too outrageous. It was just a too impractical security, and something happens, the gig's off, you know. It was just, there was too many obstacles in the way for us to do it, but we managed to do it, even though it was kind of, set up a little bit in Verona. But it really brought you into the crowd. It really brought you into being part of the whole event instead of getting shipped in on a bus and doing it. The Verona, we were there for a few days and I always remember the actual backstage because obviously you know the Colosseum in Rome and it's got, it was the same idea as that, except a kind of smaller Colosseum, you know, it was huge. Yeah. But it was so intact and down, I imagined it to be downstairs, but it probably was the downstairs. The dressing room was under arches that, I guess, supported the whole frame of the building. Mm. And it really brought you into the feeling of being like a gladiator and you heard the crowd go mm. mental. And you're thinking, we're going to go up there and we're going to get ripped <laughs> apart with a lion. <laughs> 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 so we, but yeah, it gives you this strength to think that, I uh, know that well, history, you know, when you think about the, the Romans and what they did and the, how, how massive and, and powerful they were. And there we were sitting in this same place we imagined to have a gladiator go and fight a lion and a, and a Christian. <laughs> you know? yeah. And you really felt it. You really felt that this is, this is, this is going to be mega. You know, you could just feel the crowd and, and, and the environment. It was, it was beautiful. I'll never forget it. It's, I mean, yeah, I just uh, called up this picture of the, uh, the arena. Yeah. So I mean, it's a spectacular a place, Stunning, stunning arena. Yeah, I bet the acoustics are pretty special in that kind yeah. of place. No, it yeah. was a real special gig. That I'm so glad that we did film that. It was a perfect one for it. Yeah, it's a pretty rare thing to know that the moment you're in is going to be something special. Because usually it's afterwards we look back and reflect and find that that is an incredible moment. But yeah, I can't true. imagine that to be in the moment and recognize it at that time must have been absolutely yeah. amazing. I mean, it was difficult not to identify the importance of it. I mean, the gig, the gigs of that tour. That was the last tour. They were all pretty big gigs, you know, the San Siro Stadium and it was a Milton Keynes Bowl and it was Leeds around here. It was, there were big, big events almost. It was almost kind of, even before big festivals, now it's, now it's just a festival gig yeah. where loads of bands play, but that was the kind of general tour. But when you got to Verona and you saw what it was like and the whole feeling of it and the way we got merged into it, it really hit a moment for me personally during the show and afterwards. Because it was just, it was just beautiful. It just felt great to be part of it. Yeah. Do you, uh, do, you, do you miss those big stadium gigs, or do you uh, kind of hanker for the, the the early days when it was small, sweaty, steamy clubs and and that kind of thing? Or um, 
you know, what's your preference these days? Well, I, I think I don't know. I mean, to me, there, there were I didn't I don't sort of differentiate too much between the big gigs and the wee gigs. Obviously, the wee gigs are hard work and they're sweaty and you're carrying half your own gear in and out. I don't miss <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> you try get dressed in the back seat of a bus and look like you're you know. But they're still been. they're still this for me. It's a it's a it's a performance that you've got to take very seriously, and I took every, I, I still take every single performance really seriously, no matter how many people are there. The the big gigs obviously come with all the, the pressure of, of a big gig, and you think, well, the wee ones maybe no, but they do. I think they all you know, somebody's spent their good money on a ticket to come and see a band, and you don't want to take it lightly. You don't want to just brush it away like it's just another day because every day, every gig is it's good to you feel privileged to be there in the first place mm -hmm. and you're privileged that people are actually buying a ticket to come and see you. Yeah. So no, it was I, I don't I don't kinda of see the bigs or the small being that much different. Mm -hmm. and people would say also, were well, you know nervous at the big ones and opposed to but we were we were really well rehearsed. We we could really go in and, and do a gig and quite stoned condition <laughs> you know? but because we're, we really worked hard at it we went through the songs again and again and again we, we, you know what I mean it was almost like we just know this is, this is the way this is going to work mm. so I think the fact that you've got the confidence of being so rehearsed the only weak link for me was the gear and the technology letting me down Mm -hmm. You know, or you know, so we knew everybody put all the work in. We'd done our best that we could. Knew we were going to go and play it, and that was kind of what happened. And, and took them very, very seriously. Yeah, because Simple Minds got big when stadium gigs got big. You know, it was. It seemed to you know that that, that kind of desire for big stadium rock gigs. And you just happened at the same time, and that was kind of like a real serendipitous, yeah, you know, moment. And and you you grabbed it and and it kind of made it your own. Uh, that's true. Yeah, it all grew and grew, and we grew into it. Yeah, there was it kind of there was there wasn't the big. I mean, I think we were the first band to play at Ibrox, which is the Glasgow Rangers yeah. Football Club, and that kind of launched a lot. In fact, I think we opened up the Barlands actually for the whole wow. live thing was yeah. pretty good. That it was it was getting bigger and bigger, and we also identified the fact that the music's got to um, go f go with that and mirror that. Mm. And as much as that, you can't actually. I, I always remember at sound checks thinking this is a bloody rabble, you know, like w w some of the songs that we were done already, trying the slaps coming off the halls, and it's like we need to stop, kind of cut this down a wee bit. And it definitely steered the writing to cut the drums down a wee bit in half tempo and create some space and leave some gaps here. You know, even song, 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 song. There's nothing wrong with leave a wee bit of gap and try and get the noise to stabilise a little bit. So it definitely, it, the, the bigger we got and the bigger the, the PA got, the, the more this writing kind of complemented that, I think. We, look, we looked at that. So it, it was kind of basically feeding... It was it's kind of this loop, wasn't it? You know, the yeah. bigger you got, the bigger the sound, the bigger the stadium, the bigger the songs. That's so, right. Yeah, all all yeah. kind of matted together. Yeah, quite, quite naturally. Amazing. I can yeah. see that. You, you you've got a, a your old writing style might not work in these new venues as definitely. well. Definitely. Yeah, so definitely. So you've got to, you've got to work with what you you're going to haven't you yeah you definitely did that they sounded like huge stadium anthems and yeah yeah well i think the you know the two things the the stadiums itself and just like what mick was saying was um uh it's been mentioned by uh, a lot of the hard rock bands or particularly like bands like Def Leppard with Mutt Lang, like creating a sound that will work in a stadium and mm. you got to have that more yeah. space and then also you know, maybe in combination with that, when we think of 80s, we also think of those big reverbs that we started getting with the, the lexicons and yeah, other electronic right. reverbs. Also, now you'd be able to have that live sound, but in the studio in a way. Yeah. That is interesting how it shaped this, the songwriting itself. Yeah, totally. No, absolutely. Chris, funny you mentioned uh, Def Leppard there. I went to their, their last gig. It was in the Hydro. It was the Hysteria mm. gig. And I, didn't, I actually yeah. went because my friend... Who's Robin Zander was in uh, Cheap Trick. He was opening up for them and he invited us. But I, I, I wasn't in Stendit. I didn't go to see Def Leppard, but I was there with my wife and 
honestly, I was totally blown away with the sound and it was just those the first five or six songs I didn't realise I knew Def Leppard so well. It was it just blew me away. It's amazing. One of the best concerts I've been to for years was that Def Leppard gig. Mm, that's a cracking album as well. Hysteria. Oh, it was amazing. It's just, really. yeah. Fun, fun right. fact, all, all the drums on Hysteria, Fairlight Series 3. Is, it? is that right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Well, yeah. Everything I mean, he did a right great job as well, considering the circumstances. He, he took yeah. uh, had to turn his whole life around with that. Absolutely. He was, he was a Yorkshire. Was it a Yorkshire crash or something like that? Mm. Yeah. That somewhere well, there, there anywhere some, near you, yeah. Ben? Is that in your way? Uh, yeah. it, well, it, it's the, the Sheffield the aren't they? Them lot. Yeah. 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 yeah, bit, yeah a bit further north. The was it a snake pass? Was Probably like that. Oh, Some Woodhead. That, yeah. Woodhead's a bit mad as well. That's yeah. been a few yeah. crashes on that. Yeah. Yeah. Join yeah. us for the next edition of Country File here on the ProSynth Network. <laughs> 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 um, so I want to text. This is, this is fascinating stuff, and I don't really want to stop the flow, but I do want to test the audio thing because I've, okay. whilst you've been chatting away, I've been frantically swapping browsers and uh, doing things. So please tell me if, uh, let me just add this to here. So this is that Kurtzfile K250. Hopefully, right. you'll be able to hear this now. Uh, let me just skip just ahead, just a little bit here. Um, so this is a guy who's playing a Kurtzfile K250. And it sounds just brilliant. Not so much, uh, it doesn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me try one more thing, and okay. then and then then we'll just knock it on the head. So let what me tune just, is it? Uh, Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Do you know oh, that yeah. one, Mick? Do you know that? Well, I don't know how to play it, but I, I know it, and it's a Tchaikovsky. Isn't it? Is it? Is it Tchaikovsky? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so the, right. Not, they're not cracker. Let's try this one more time, please. Oh, let me see if I can get it. What, what's his name? Let's see if I can play. Oh, oh there, well, you there you go. There we go. There we go. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I just think, you know, number one, this is a, a sampler or sample sound source from 1984. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's one of the of first, thing, not the first, but one of the first ROM based uh, sample playback uh, machines. But the quality of the sound is just incredible. And the fact that the guy plays every single part himself. He split the sounds across the keyboard and he's just playing. You know, the playing skills are brilliant. The sound is just fantastic. And it's 1984. Yeah. That's just know. stunning. And you think, like, the, the Series 3 Fairlight, which came out a year after this, that was like the flagship all singing, all dancing thing, none of that was in ROM. All of that was like floppy disks or hard disk drives, and you had to load up the sounds before you could do anything. This thing, you just yeah. call up the sound and play, and it was like 1984. I know, no, it was some machine. I remember when I went into the shop. I remember exactly where I bought it. It was a shop that I think Peter Gabriel had something to do with. It was a kind of synth shop. Psycho, Psycho Systems. Psycho yeah. System, that's right. Yeah, yeah and they, put, they showed me this thing, and it, as soon as I heard it, I thought, I've got to have it. I remember the timpani, the bass guitar, the acoustic bass, and the grand piano. The, the, oh, it was just so unbelievable. The strings were incredible. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I need that. I, we need that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you, you then also need four roadies to, to carry yeah. it around and, and set it up because it was huge, wasn't well, it? Well, the I other mean, thing as well, I, I, it's huge, but it was also a real piano keyboard, which I wasn't yes. really used to. So I, I was still used to the kind of plastic stuff. So even though I had it, I had it buried on stage. I had it midi then, I patched into it. So oh, right. that was all sitting in front of my roadie guy who changed the presets for me and, and set up the sounds. I just played that from oh. the CP70 or the or a synth or the, or the, the DX7. Look at the size of the power cable. <laughs> I know. Because <laughs> no. it had this in, ingenious thing that was actually the power supply and the pedals were all in this one massive black box. Yeah, then just the pedals boom. was a huge thing as yeah. well. I remember the pedal board. I know, I know, it was stuff. brilliant. Really, I loved it. I live in an American house, and I don't think I could fit that thing into the house. It's huge. Yeah. It is. But, yeah, but that was the entire machine, you know, 
Yeah, Stevie like Wonder we got behind it. The guy he as did, well. Yeah. He was because it was. I think it was the guy was was he blind? The guy that that, that was that designed it. There was no, it was it basically. And this is the story as I kind of know it is that Stevie spoke to Ray Kurzweil, and Ray Kurzweil was looking at producing things to help people with uh, visual impairments or stuff like that. And right. he said that you know they worked together. I think Stevie probably invested in the company as well. Right. They worked together uh, to produce the the K two. 50 and stevie of course got number one as he always does with you know all of these machines he gets serial yeah. number one um but he was a huge uh, you know he moved from i think from a fair like to the kurtzwell k250 and and then stayed with the company for a little while but uh yeah it's fascinating yeah, that is just huge just huge right. but i saw that came up on um one of these kurtzwell user groups that i hang around in and i just thought that was amazing that you know a piece of technology some 36 37 years old um, yeah. Sounded that good back then. Just really cool stuff. Yeah. Mm. Should we do a few more news topics and we can come back to Mick? Um, yeah. 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 So it. now we've got audio working. Hopefully, um, we we were speaking about Spectrasonics um, and the their plugins. Just to kind of come back, circle back to that. They're available now. They're 149 bucks each, but you do need Omnisphere to to run those, and they sound amazing. Uh, Eric and the the team from Spectrasonics did a, like a two and a half hour presentation video, and it's good because it, it, it's it's Spectrasonics quality. So um, if you want to go and watch that, please do. Um, another updated release uh, that came about in the last couple of weeks that we haven't spoken about is the um, the new software upgrade for this thing. Excuse me, Windy Pops. Um, this is the Akai Force, uh, which has now been updated to 3.1, and this now loads in all of the plugins and uh, processing that the Akai MPC range got in its update just previously. Now, uh, the Force is more in line with that kind of Ableton paradigm of clips and launching uh, various parts, you know, through that, that that big grid that you see there at the front. It's one of those um, you know, kind of niche instruments that you know you either like MPCs or you like this. It's it's a stunning piece of gear, and also you can connect audio interfaces to it. You can uh, add loads of uh, USB connectivity. That's it's got Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, it's got CV and gate. I mean, it really can become your central part of uh, of your performance, whether it's in the studio or on stage. And the update, of course, is free to all. Um, Akai Force owners. So as you can see, this particular one, you've got the nice. um, the Mellotron um, uh, plug-in just showing there in the screen. So these all run natively within the instrument itself. Um, I'm I, I I would actually I, I never got on with the MPC. I didn't again. It's like Ableton it didn't really click with me. But for some reason, whilst Ableton doesn't click in my head, I look at this and think it might. But I'm not entirely sure. Has anyone ever used uh, an Akai Force or had a go with one of these, or were you all completely clueless on this? Uh, I'm pretty clueless on it. I think it looks good, like, but um, my mate Gaz has got one, uh, yeah. and it, he was made up when this this update came out because mm. it, it it brings a lot to it, doesn't it? You know, it, the porting stuff over from the MPC Studio, like, but it makes a massive difference to that machine. And, and and that machine possibly wouldn't have interested me at all at one point, but now I'm thinking that that would replace a laptop live that easily, you know. Yeah. You do everything on that, and, and but it's more I don't know, it's more immediate, isn't it? Instead of faffing yeah. around, it, so and especially like with these, you you can connect any peripheral to it now, can't yeah. you? Well, well, not anything, but like these controllers and that. So that opens it up as well. So yeah, exactly. I think it's a it's a a cracking move by Akai to to do this. And it's yeah. it's put a load of mm. life in a product that was probably on its last legs without it. You know, it's it's really, really good. Yeah. It's, it's also really got disc up, streaming up now, so you can stream samples yeah. direct from the uh, from the discs Glad and um uh, have longer recording and playback times and you can also fit a, a disc drive underneath it as well so you can just like you know pop in your own ssd drive and, oh right yeah. yeah it really makes for a, a sort of thing um and of course it has you know the whole touch screen thing and the clip sent uh the clip connectivity at the back and that's just um just if we'll zoom in on that so 
yeah, it has a whole wealth of connectivity. If you are in the modular world, you know, you've got CV and gate, you've also got MIDI in and out, oh, yeah. audio ins and outs, um, USB host and a USB slave in there as well. Mm. And even the, um, uh, yeah. the, the network Land. link in there. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say with the NPCs, you can can't you download like stuff off Splice and and that straight into the machines. I believe so, yeah. And so I think mm. I, I'm, I'm guessing that that you can do much the same here. <clears> uh, yeah. I'd say I'm no no expert on these anymore. I'm NPC old stuff definitely, but you get so many um, uh, plugins with this now. It's crazy, you know. You get all the uh, the Air stuff, which of course is owned by In Music, so they're you know, kind of cross pollinating there. Um, but you've got all these uh, sounds and tools and these, yeah, there you go, splice integration. So there it oh, is. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, of course, uh, integration with Ableton Live, and then you have the Force Academy, which is you know, helps you get started. But, yeah, it's just a, a really powerful, powerful tool. Um, yeah, it looks good. So, yeah. I'm surprised nobody's really looked in more into getting collaboration software or something that eliminates this latency where people can more play together and keep it live. There was something I read mm. today about G5, mobile G5. It's been launched somewhere, in, maybe in the border somewhere. Yeah. But I think that's going to kind of be a bit of a game changer as far as visuals go. They were talking about holograms and you know, running stuff that are just huge files really, really fast. Yeah. So maybe there'll be something in there in the kind of not so distant future where I can actually play along with you guys and we're all in time and it's not... Yeah. I hope so. Well, I don't know if I'll be in time. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'll definitely be enjoying it. <laughs> I mean, that sort, of, that sort of thing has been tried before. You know, um, Ohm Force did a thing, didn't they, with um, Ohm Studio, which was all supposed to be... Uh, trying to synchronize people remotely. Yeah. Uh, didn't didn't Cubase have something Rocket Studios? Yeah. Yeah. Rocket. Yeah. Something. I never. Years, years I never ago. tried it. I, well, I did try yeah. it, and there was just like a spinning thing for about an hour, and so we yeah. turned it off and never turned it on again. Yeah. 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 Well, unfortunately, we're still dealing with the physics of the situation. Yeah. And that yeah. We have to have some way to transfer information, and so. If you're in the same city, a program like those that you're mentioning will work pretty well. Like I could, you know, call up my buddy and we could jam online. But, you know, us from California to, to England would uh, or Scotland would be yeah. too much. I mean, that would be like half a second. Yeah, it's going to be uh, some sort of big buffering thing. It's going to stick everybody in a, in a space. We're all going to yeah. view in their own time. Wasn't um because just was it yesterday or today that... Um, Facebook announced that their parent company is going to be called Meta, uh, and that's to yeah. better uh, align itself with the Meta, uh, the Meta Internet or the Metaverse, Metaverse. where it's uh, a place rather than looking into it, you are inside it. Yeah. So, I think maybe that's going to be you know where I we're all so. kind of inside that kind of. Yeah, all, all this space. all this stuff is in there. You know, like all yeah. the plugins, all the, all the software is in this space, and you go in. And mm, use yeah. it, but for me right now, uh, it's far away. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's too far. It's almost getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear. Um, so anyway, there you go. That's the uh, my noise is, is just as red. So. <laughs> it is now. It's been, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the Akai Force. Oh, oh. oh he's, got, he's doing his Ken dog thing now. <laughs> Also, uh, just <laughs> mentioned that if people Keep are working. more interested in the uh, Akai Force, uh, uh, our friend Ramsey, as well as um, yes. Andrew Brooks here in the chat, did a whole thing on it last week they on uh, yeah. Ramsey's channel. Yeah, so go and watch that. And I'm sure if you have any questions, they'll be in a much better place to answer them than... <laughs> The yeah. us that have never touched one of those. Um, let's another software release that came out um, this well, just the other day. Um, I wanted to ask if Mick had actually ever owned one of these himself. Uh, yeah, this is the sense. the new oh, right. JD eight hundred uh, software synthesizer from Roland. It's part of the Roland Cloud. Um, so they've already done a JD eight hundred in software, but it was the model expansion for the Xenology plugin. Right. Uh, this sounds. Uh, very much like, obviously very much like the hardware, but it sounds almost identical to what they've previously released. So I don't know whether they've just kind of laid a new skin on the top. But, um, mm -hmm. Ben, you're, you're currently kind of working on a comparison video. So maybe you can give us your 
early thoughts of um of the the new jd 800 plugin yeah um i i put it on and at first like it's like wow this looks fantastic because the rolling stuff usually looks a bit crap to be honest <laughs> and, and and this actually looks really impressive so i thought yeah it's going to be smart list and i started playing on it i thought oh that's spot on that that sounds absolutely fantastic so then i got my jd out and I, i'm doing a bit of comparing on the two i thought it doesn't sound exactly like the original bit but it's close enough you know it's well close enough it, it's it's great in a mix but isolated you can tell little slight ch differences i thought but but the xenology was like that when i did that so then i compared the xenology to the new software synth and i couldn't really hear any difference at all and uh, um, when when you said that about it being reskinned and that, I went in and looked at all the information and they said that they'd done all this modeling and uh, circuit behavior and gone to painstaking detail to recreate uh, the nuances of, of the original synth. And it, it does, it's, it's great. It's great. But if you've already got this, the Zencore version, I, I'm really, I don't see what you're gaining from yeah getting this mm -hmm. one i mean um, it looks fantastic other than, yeah other yeah than it that. looks fan fantastic compared to the other one but the the difference in sound is hardly noticeable there is there is a difference I, i've really scrutinized it and i had to like really play things over and over and i thought yeah it's a little bit it's got a little bit more more depth but not enough not enough to like say like oh I, well I've already got Zenko I'm gonna mm. get this new one you don't yeah. you don't need really just stick no. with Zenko unless it's... you you're subscribing and then yeah then you just it. have both yeah yeah I, um I I asked the question um when it came out as to whether this was just uh, a skin on top of uh, you know the Xenology technology Xenology <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> technology <laughs> um <laughs> and somebody said that it had been claimed that this was DCB, so this is their digital circuit behavior ah, right, technology. That's what it's called. But that statement apparently since been retracted, so maybe it isn't ah. the DCB technology, and maybe it is yeah. the Xenology technology. Um, mm. So yeah. I, I honestly that, don't know. My biggest that disappointment a, with that this. That makes me look like a right tool now. Huh? No, I'm no, 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 not at it all. It's slightly different, and it isn't because it's but the same it, no, thing. But it, no, but it might, it might be, it might be different. I just, but yeah. nobody yeah. seems to really know. They don't certainly say in the blurb. the The disappointment I had with the other JD eight hundred. I've never played a JD eight hundred, so I'm, I'm really keen to have this in in, in my uh, toolkit. But when they brought the first Xenology version out. They missed out the special drum kit that was part of the layers that you had mm. when you were in multi mode, and that drum kit you know, is very famously used on Genesis. Genesis's "I Can't Dance." It was that yeah. that whole drum pattern is is um, Tony playing that on 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 the JD eight hundred, and they missed that out of the Xenology thing. And I seem to remember there being an excuse as to why that had, had happened. So when this came out, I thought, ah, oh, they must have listened to us. Mm -mm. No, they hadn't. They've missed it out on this one as well. But also, um, there are a huge amount of, or there was a, certainly a considerable amount of expansion cards that you could pop into this to give extra waveforms and, and, and further sounds. And they've not included any of that stuff. They've lit literally just included the, the original presets and some new ones that they've uh, yeah. slung together. And when you look at uh, instruments like Korg's M1 uh, software plugin has all of the Korg cards. Even the Prophecy has all of the Korg cards, and the Tritons yeah. all come with those sound expansions. And you think, well, why? Why didn't you just throw those in? I mean, hopefully yeah. they'll add them in uh, as, as additions. But yeah, it, it, it um, also. I'm not, I'm not... Been... Oh, sorry, Chris. It's go ahead, go ahead, Ben. Uh, I was just going to say, also would have been nice because the the, the JD800 is covered in sliders. 
And mm. it would have been nice if it just instantly worked as a controller for, for you the know, software. Yeah, for the, for the software. Day, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. well, so that's what Omnisphere do that, don't they? They've, yeah. all, they've got all the plugins that work in with the, the actual software. That would yeah. have been great because the problem with the JD eight hundred sliders is they don't yeah. uh, they don't transmit CC, yeah. so you can't even map them. They, they yeah. transmit SysX, but Roland obviously know what that that SysX is, and yeah. could yeah. have quite yeah. easily put it into the software. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think that's a missed <clears throat> opportunity as well. Uh, uh, apparently, one of your colleagues says last time I was at Ben's, I broke one of the keys on his JD800, and he's never been invited back round since. Coincidence? I thought, I thought he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> well, the pipe to the, apparently, the pipe to the back of the head didn't finish him off yeah, there, Ben. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you were going to say, Chris, you were going to say something. Well, just uh, you know, in to regards to what you were saying about how they they kind of kind of skimp on that compared to Korg, where you know Korg in their their Triton stuff is like you get everything all in one, and it's very nice. It makes sense that they would do that, even if they charge a little bit more. But Roland has like kind of doled it out with their SRX stuff. I mean, you, you know, here's sixty nine dollars for every single little card thing that they've produced. Yeah. Like, why don't you just put it all in one? And and the other the other big complaint too would be some of the functions that are included on the JD900 that could have just been put into this as well and make just one thing, maybe yeah. two different skins for it. But yeah. no, they'll they'll give us a JD900 as a whole separate update and make a big hurrah about it. Yeah, yeah just right. to charge you more money. I'm sure that was, I, I'd never had a JD800, but I think it was a JD990, it was a rack-mounted module. Yeah. And I, I, they again had the expansion cards. And I was tempted then, I bought them all, and I, I never ever used them. It was just like, you'd think, uh, there must be something on this that I need that I, I think I should have. And you mm. end up spending more money on these expansion cards. And you think, why, why did I bother spending that? I never even used the thing. But yeah. I had one more thought about what Ben had said there about the way that Omnisphere have incorporated all the old synthesizers into, into the set so you can actually go to the controls and it'll work on the plug-in. If you had the JD800 keyboard, which I think you've got, and you bought the plug-in, what, what would be the point in having both? Um... Just to change, just to use, just change the buttons. That's, that's the million dollar question, is it? <laughs> well, you can have you, you can have loads of them. <laughs> yeah. that, that's it. You can have loads of them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good enough excuse. I'm up for that. <laughs> I'll um, give that for a reason. Yeah. So uh, JD800. If you're a Roland uh, Roland Cloud subscriber. It's in your account uh, if you have the, I think, is it the Pro account and, and up? So uh, you can just go and download that now and try it out. And, yeah, it's good fun. And, again, the, the other trick that they've missed with this and what they really, if they did this, everybody would laugh and actually have a little bit of respect for Roland for just entertaining it. So the JD800 is, uh, is notorious for this thing called the red glue uh, <laughs> problem where the, the glue that they use to stick the weights under the keys uh, – disintegrates and, and uh, deteriorates over time and it starts to drip and it goes into the mechanics of the keyboard and if you don't catch it in time oh. you can actually you know require a whole new keyboard or oh. a, a terrible cleaning process what they should have done with this is that after maybe 30 minutes of maybe playing it or having it loaded up you've got these little red gloopy drops coming out of the bottom of the keyboard and we'd have all gone oh look yeah roland have got a sense of humor and they might have uh, might have bought a few more friends that way but there you go so yeah roland cloud subscribers or i think there is also a lifetime uh, key available for around 150 it's normally the price um yeah. but if you are a roland cloud subscriber it's in there and you can also make it one of your lifetime uh, keys. So if you do decide to leave Roland Cloud, you still keep this as well. So that's out there now. Um, so that is that. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is this little thing. And this is actually from somebody who is a member of our group. And so I thought, well, this, this really does need uh, to be shared around. Um, Amy Lee is her name, and this is the new version of her analog morphing synthesizer for iOS. And it's now um, a universal app, so it works on both iPad and iPhone. Um, and it's kind of got a tracker sequencer in there, but it's got some really great uh, sound. So let me just bring up the video demo now that we have 
audio that is working and um, let me just bring this up and share a little bit of this with you uh, I really need to get my act together with this here we go right So there you go, that's uh, Analog, Analog Morphing Synthesizer. It's available now on the uh, Apple Store. Um, Mick Bear just appeared. Um, so I think it's about yeah. six ninety nine. Mick, are you? do you use iPads? Uh, well, for, for I, I used to, when the, when the Arturia stuff came out, oops, is that me? Sorry, yeah, no, that's, no, that's me, sorry. <laughs> right, you know, when that Arturia stuff came out, I thought, this is going to be great. I've got to hand it, I don't know who put that together, but you've got to hand it to them. They get through a lot of process to get that thing happening, get it up yeah. in Apple and do all that. That's really good, and it was. Fun. It looks like a fun wee box, and I, I loved hearing those old things, this kind of syndrome thing, and it was kind of a bit of an equinox in there, you know, that... Yeah. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> You know, it's all. It's, I think it's all fun stuff, and for it's a cheap price. It's maybe going yeah. to get some kids into it. Get a, a gift on a kid and get them off a game and try and get them to create something. Yeah. You know, it's got it's got a load of things that are kind of sweet about it. The whole idea is really sweet, and uh, you're hoping somebody will get something from it. And you're not going to spend a lot of money to try it. I, I love it. I love the idea of it. Though it's not something I would buy at the moment, but mm. it's. I would encourage it. I'd encourage yeah, somebody. Definitely. And say yeah. for six ninety nine, you, you, yeah. know, you can't really go wrong. Um, guy, it had a tracker uh, in there. I never really got into yeah. tracker sequences. Ben, were, were you uh, a tracker guy at all? I used to love tracking on, on the Amiga. Um, that, that was really. Uh, I, I had an Atari ST uh, with Cubase on it at the mm -hmm. time, but next to that, I also had an Amiga uh, with just Octa Tracker on it or whatever it was. Yeah, and and I absolutely loved that way of working. It, it just clicked with me. Really, I probably should try all these Ableton things and that because it's probably what it's based on. But uh, uh, I, I just loved it at the time, and that really like made my eyes light up in, in you know the demo of that. I thought, oh, that tracker, it's brilliant. Because I've got the old version of this. All uh, right, yeah. I, I bought this when 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 it came out last time mm -hmm. because. Uh, it's Amy, isn't it? Amy, Amy Lee, Amy's yeah. in the group. Like, and I wanted yeah. to support her, and uh, it's not a lot of money, and so I thought I'd give it a whirl, and it's, it's really good. But mm. I, I'm not. I don't think that that track is in it, uh, and that that I, I'm going to upgrade now and get that yeah. and have a mess about on that because that that probably suits the uh, mobile composing like situation more than traditional sequencing does. Because you just mm. drop things in on, and they play at a certain point, you know. Yeah. You can have multiple samples on the same lane. And it, it, it just seems to, I think it would work great as a portable yeah. music maker. That, yeah, absolutely. You know. uh, apparently Amy wrote that track uh, across a couple of weeks on the on the app. And everything you heard in that uh, yeah. that demo there is from Analog. So it's the whole thing is there. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed with the name. I've got to be honest. I think she should have called it Amy Log. Amy Log. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been. Hey, uh, <laughs> yeah. A real, a real quick uh, thing here because I've been watching the comments. Uh, when you search the uh, app store for it, it, it basically searches for analog and auto corrects it. But oh, just yeah. believe uh, the search, it'll say search for analog instead. Make sure you click that because you won't see it until you you hit that, and then it pops up with the correct search, and it's the first thing. Yeah cool stuff yeah um but yeah i mean it's always great to support you know our, our, our members in there and um amy's been in there a little while now and, and this is just uh, it's a cracking little thing um instruments sequences it's all in there it's just like everything on the go and you can do some really cool stuff so good luck with that amy and maybe we can get her on the show at some point to 
uh, sort of run us through how she went about that because mm-hmm. I don't think we've had yeah. an iOS uh, music developer on the show, have we? I'm pretty no. sure we haven't. Oh, but no, no, no. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, so we'll do that. I was thinking we'll, about Dom then, but are you, are you, oh yeah, you? yeah, that was a plug-in, wasn't it? So yeah, it wasn't iOS, oh, yeah. but uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, always good stuff. Right, uh, what shall we do next? Um, we've done the Roland. How about uh, Arturia? Um, they have just updated their um, little uh, micro freak uh, with a brand new firmware that introduces wavetables, no less. Um, I did have a demo lined up here, but it seems to have vanished off my screen. Uh, Arturia micro freak. Here we go. Uh, you think I'd be getting the hang of this by now, don't you? There we go. Microfreak. So this has um, really um, become a very, very popular little instrument. It's very affordable. It has this kind of unique um, capacitive interface uh, in terms of the keyboard. It's got some cracking sounds in there. It's only €349. Euro. Um, and the, the, the version 4 update adds in um, wavetable synthesis. So let's have a quick listen to the demo. So that's the uh, the version four firmware <coughs> update from yeah. uh, Arturia. It's sad. I mean, I believe all, everything great. we heard. Yeah, everything we heard was was micro freak. I believe apart well, from the drums, maybe. It really, were well, you a wavetable guy, Mick? Did you get into PPGs and all no, that kind of stuff? No, really. I remember when it came out, and I remember a few records it was on. I never, I never got it really. It was kind of too glassy, sharp sounding. There was something really digital about it that it was just kind of hard you know I, I never really got it at all no. I'm just listening to that there I mean that felt I know it sounds weird to say it felt good when it's a machine running and I remember always as producer we worked with him and his name he kept talking about the Lynn drum it just feels better and I'm like what are you talking about it's a drum machine you know what I mean it feels better <laughs> what is it like Mick Fleetwood running late or something like that you know <laughs> like, but that there did feel good you know that when you heard the sequencer mm. at the start it was all big beefy sequence I, when I push these things in you get the bass you know that's another weird thing about headphones but it kind of felt like it was all pulling it back behind it was some, there was something felt really good about that Mm, yeah, definitely. Chris, uh, thoughts? Uh, do you own a Micro Freak? You do, don't you? Yeah, and yeah. I have a sound set for it that I put out last year. It's a great oh, little synthesizer. It, uh, yeah, at sentientsound.com. It's like nine bucks. That's almost <laughs> negative money in pounds. Yeah, nowadays, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm assuming it, you've, you've installed this. No, I haven't yet. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is, it already had wavetables before, um, right. which, which you know, I, I'm kind of with Mick. A lot of times, the results from them are not that great. Although, um, you know, was able to get some nice sounds from the the, the previous uh, engine that runs wavetables. So I imagine the new one will be great as well, uh, as well as the hydrosynth, which is probably my favorite right behind me, uh, my favorite wavetable synth. But um, this really, the big thing is it allows you to edit your own and uh, and then load them onto the Micro Freak. So those people that are looking for mm. like the, you know, be able to do your own stuff, you know, record your voice in there as a wavetable or some crazy sound. That's the thing that kind of opens it up for people. Yeah. Um, as for me, I, I would rather program FM at extended <laughs> lengths of time than do wave ta- <laughs> uh, wavetable editing. <laughs> Isn't so, that, so with this? Um, so if it, in case anyone is interested, there is Chris's sound set for the Micro Freak, uh, a mere twelve bucks. 
um, and there's a demonstration on there. I think we've, we played that when it came out. Um, so that's there. So with the wavetable stuff, you say it can create its own, or you can create your own wavetables and import them in there. So that there are a number of wavetable apps that you can do, you know, create wavetables in. And so I'm assuming you can make create your table in that and then just, uh, I'm led to believe yeah. it's just like a drag and drop thing, isn't it? Um, I, I watched some some of the video, like just scanned a video of them doing it, and I don't recall what the it, – it's through the uh, app that Arturia has. I can't even remember the name of it is right now. But they have an app that goes with the um, MicroFreak, which you can do, like, you know, exchange patches. This update also comes with, I think, 64 new patches. Yeah. So you can swap through stuff – back and forth between your computer and the microfreak using that app and then this other one it allows you to do the editing i guess for it mm. i'm sorry I, again i haven't done the update so i'm, <laughs> I'm not the greatest what's your resource name ben simpson on that. <laughs> <laughs> i've yeah, downloaded it but i spilled guinness on it and yeah <laughs> <laughs> um can i just also uh, quickly say a very big thank you to tasafi music uh for his uh, his or her, I don't know, um, little donation there. There was another one that I missed. I know uh, Adamski d uh, gave us something there. There was another one. Uh, if I've missed you, thank you uh, for your donation. Everything is gratefully received. It keeps us on air. Um, ben, what do you think of this one? You don't have a microfreak, do you? I don't know, but um, I, these updates, they just make it more appealing all the time, which I suppose yeah. is the point of doing it. But, uh, yeah, and since I got the Matrix Brute, it's like I, I, I'm suddenly I'm interested in anything that that Arturia make because I just love that thing. So if mm. it's any if if it's a fraction as good as the the Matrix Brute, then it's going to be great. And I think I might get one because it's it's quite cheap and it's it's Three, quite four, a capable nine, yeah. yeah capable little machine. That I think sequence. when it first came out, yeah, I think when it first came out, people looked at it and thought, oh, it's just like a cheap plasticky thing. It doesn't have proper yeah. keys on. It has yeah. that kind of capacitive yeah. surface. <clears throat> But then I think when people got their hands on it, they found out actually that's what really makes it. It makes it a very expressive instrument. And it has brute oscillators. Is, is that correct, yeah. Chris? Yeah. It has yeah. some oscillators from the mutable instruments um, oh, class. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Mutable is so the then, same ones that have got the – there's a it. lot of modules from mutable, don't they? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. True. yeah. So the, those are great sounding, but then also the ones that Arturia have done themselves, which I think mm. outnumber the mutable ones probably by now. Um, it, it's shocking because it's a oh, also, and uh, our last week's guest, uh, Alex Hartman, designed the, the industrial course. design on it, yeah, but yeah. uh, it you know, it's this little plastic synthesizer, and, and you kind of if you hold it and you, you just look at it, it's a beautiful, but you might not think it's going to be the yeah. great big sound that it has but when you when you are playing it and running it it, it just it makes some really great music and so it's got a mono output so one of the key things is to have some good stereo effects with it just yeah. like you would do like with a you know profit five or something where it, it's not going to be sending the sound out everywhere in the stereo field so you got to use some other things to do that but when you do it's just, it's quite amazing it's it's a really for the price it's a really great synthesizer yeah and some of the videos i've done on my channel like when i did the sound set I showed what the dry sound was, but then also with some um, <clears throat> like Valhalla plugins and a few other things like the um, the Tal chorus and all that, and it just really opens that up. Yeah. It's fat sounding for a little little piece yeah. of plastic hardware. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Arturia, I've always come up with they're, they're kind of they were growing really really fast. There, I think the first Arturia stuff I got was in the iPad, which mm -hmm. is why I, I didn't want to be kind of harsh with uh, Amy. Was it Amy? Yeah. With her thing because the iPad touching and moving the faders and all that, you'd really need a simple wee piece of hardware or something you could mm. just instantly latch to the to the iOS system. But Arturia stuff, I bought one. It's not quite as small as that. It was uh, I think it's something Lab or something. A, there was a lab one. It was quite a bigger keyboard, and it it come with a whole bank of synthesizers, and they were all amazing. Oh, the key lab, key uh, lab. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. A, yeah. It was really brilliant. Yes, yeah. It's um, uh, I mean, we we spoke with Axel Hartman, who who did uh, has done a lot of design work for Arturi, and we were saying last week, 
you know, how they've really come on from, you know, being a software yeah. developer to now being one of the, the preeminent, um, you know, hardware synthesizers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been looking at Matrix Brutes this week because I was talking to Mike Metley earlier this week and we were talking about Matrix Brutes and Poly Brutes. And now I keep looking at the Matrix Brute and I'm really finding it, it's like it's kind of permeated my, my shopping list now. And so it's, I only it's, had it's two awesome. things. Yeah, I only yeah. had two things on there. Now I've got three. And, so, which yeah. one and you, you mentioned that mutable. I've got mutable I mean, instruments, I've got, yeah. Yeah, they've got this thing. It's called plats, or plates. You know that yeah. one for the modular. Plat, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even know how to work it yet. It was one of the boxes <laughs> that I still need to do a, a YouTube tutorial on. But the demos I've seen of that are amazing. Be- yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, mm. some good stuff going on there for sure. Uh, and we've got Glenn Darcy in the chat, I just noticed. Uh, of course, yeah. Glenn was at Arturia and did a huge amount of work uh, with them. Now, of course, at uh, Ash and Sound Machines uh, behind uh, the, the Hydra synth, which I think we uh, we spoke about um, when we were off air the other day, um, which is a really, really cool instrument. So, mm. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, um, somebody in the chat, it, it, it's... Just a general question: uh, Is Future World Machines asked if the JD eight hundred is a plug out that will work with the System eight? Now I'm not sure. I would have answered no. in the chat myself, but uh, it's, it's not. not. No. no, it's not. I, I, I think you know if if we were to do some some speculating, um, I, I uh, you know I've heard somebody also uh, somebody else bring this up like. Uh, you know, they may be coming out with some more boutiques, like a 707. And uh, it kind of, and somebody made a statement, I think it was maybe Don Solaris on Gearspace, that made a, a statement that was later, like, took taken off of there about there may be something to do with JD800. So I, I'm not sure. Again, these are just rumors. So hmm. we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> Does anybody miss gear slots? Uh, no, I never really, <laughs> I never... Never, never frequented it, that website because I, I like my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> was that no? Who is that? No, it turned into Gear Space. Is that the same Gear thing? Space, Gear Space. Yeah, yeah, they changed yeah. the name. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. No. It's. Uh, I, I, I. I've always avoided that because I don't like getting into online spats, and that just seemed to be the is place that you right? go. Yeah. 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 But well, no, no, that, I mean, to be fair, there's a lot of good information on there. It's just yeah. like rubbish as well. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's the way I kind of. You go in there knowing that it's that thing exactly. Like, yeah. there's a lot of people that you know are giving false information or fighting back and forth, but the people that are in there that are knowledgeable are so worth it. There's yeah. so many great people yeah. on there. Yeah, yeah, cause I've got a few things with um, <clears> the <throat> Reaper and I've got, a, I've got a Presonus feather port and to try and get a, a, a third party person who did a bit of software for it. That's where I got it from. It was from one of those gear space people that said, I'll go to this website, download that part of software, load it in and suddenly I've got automation, you know, you've got to add all these things in. So I found it quite helpful for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, what was that we were just talking about? That was Arturia's uh, Microfreak update version four, available to all Microfreak owners free of charge. And uh, if you buy a Microfreak now, obviously that will ship with that. Um, we haven't done an, effect, uh, an effects unit, um, so let's do one. Uh, this is a new thing from uh, SSL Native X Echo plugin. Let's have a quick listen to to what this. So this looks like a really well featured kind of plugin. If this is your thing, I'm I'm going to defer to Chris because Chris is kind of our effects expert, shall we say? Um, have you bought this? If not, um, what do you think of it so far? Yeah, so I, I do like SSL plugins, and I've I've got some of their compressors and EQs. 
Um, I, I'm a sucker for delay and granular stuff and reverbs and anything like that. Like, you know that <laughs> I'm seriously looking at it. <laughs> but um, this is this is one that I passed on, at least for now. Uh, yeah. It just didn't. It, it's gorgeous. I love their their new GUIs. Looks very nice. You know, kind of a mix between the flat and the skeuomorphic stuff, but done in a tasteful way. Um, there's so many, uh, you know, SSL has, certainly has a name in the industry, although they're kind of going through it a, a, a little bit on gear space right now. If you want to talk about spats, <laughs> oh, right. <Okay>. but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it just, it, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with this. It seems great, but it just, I've got so many other plugins and when you compare what some of the other plugins that I've, I've purchased for, you know, a third or half the price, um, can do it just didn't really strike me as uh, you know 150 bucks as being something that I, I want to invest in. Yeah. Typically, what I what I've done with SSL stuff is I've never bought it for their their huge prices. I mean they're really expensive, so they run specials every once in a while where you can get stuff for like 30 or 40 bucks, and so that's what I usually do. Yeah. But, you know, if this had been in that, you know, maybe in that price range, like, you know, <clears> I, I just love delays and it, it's such a gorgeous gooey to look at. So, but sadly, it kind of, it kind of missed it for me on this time. Yeah. Mick, are you, uh, do you go for hardware effects or software effects? Well, with the, with the SSL stuff, I did have some really cool SSL preamps. I loved them. They were mm. sets of four. Yeah. I, can't, I think Apex or Amex or something they were called. They were fantastic. But no, as far as effects go, I'm trying to really, really minimise everything. Ever since I lost control of my satellite box that was giving me the universal audio reverb for the, the Lexicon 224, you know that mm -hmm. reverb? Yeah. And I, I totally loved it and I thought I'd miss it, but I thought oh, I'll just leave, I'll try and live without it, which I have done for about two years. Then I thought, oh, I really want it back. And then I, I looked for options and the last option I came up with was this, um, what's it called? Nope. Sorry, I cut it. It's a <laughs> CR48. A CR, because I'm going to do another. The other thing about Reaper is you can have multiple sessions open. I've got like five songs open here. <laughs> so as soon as I click on the other track, my, my mic mutes. Uh, but it's this, I think it's a CR48. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Uh, have you been? Yeah. I think it's so. A, yeah. It's a, it's yeah. a plug in. I mean, it does yeah. exactly what the. It looks like the same interface yeah. as a. I'll show you, in fact, I've got time for this. What is it? Yeah, my, go for it. Left monitor. Is that my left monitor? Yeah. Uh, then my mic will cut off a second. Oh yeah, uh, the oh, soft tube. Yeah. yeah. You see that uh, soft tube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought that that just does it. That does what I thought I was missing from from the the two two four. Mhm. Excellent stuff, Ben. Are you uh, interested in this one, or is it just? It's a, like Chris. Uh, it's a, I, I like the idea of it and everything, but it's a little bit pricey for me. Uh, mm. You know, I'm more interested in things that's like around fifty quid. You know, yeah. <laughs> I have a limit. <laughs> <laughs> I know I you, you spend over. you spend so much money on it. You it, it, all, it all adds up over the years, and you just yeah. can't afford yeah. these big number numbers yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, especially you know, I will say like if oh, go ahead. No, I was just say, especially now that you can buy suites of these plugins like yeah. T Rex and stuff that yeah. gives yeah. you a little bit of everything. Why would you then, you know, or you can either buy one of those or pick and choose. But if you start to pick and choose, it does get very expensive, doesn't well, it? Well, yeah, I yeah. will. I will go over my limit when it's like a a suite, <clears throat> like the Arturia yeah. effects. Yeah, and yeah, the Arturia ones are very that, good because that seemed like good value. And yeah. I have got my money's worth out of that. I've been using quite a lot of effects in that on on mm. loads of stuff but i find it a bit cpu intensive that that stuff so mm. yeah Sorry yeah I, I was gonna i was gonna say that you know uh, kind of same way like I, I will spend money in fact i would rather have the option to spend more money, more money. and get the thing that i actually want than to just keep a, a low budget the budget uh, but when, uh, it but when to, it comes to hey i'm getting yep. some echo yeah something uh, sorry though it was me i think my my speaker uh, was on there uh, but when it, um, but when it comes to something like, e even if it is $30 or something that's extraordinarily cheap, cause we've covered a lot of great plugins that have been very inexpensive, but at some point it does like it, you know, as you guys are saying, like it adds up over time. So I'm not opposed to spending something, especially if you can find a plugin 
that is just going to be a go to it's worth it to even you know spend 150 bucks to get that thing that is going to make your whole life easier that one thing that that just brings everything together and is fits your work workflow is beautiful despite the fact that you have a whole bunch of other plugins that that do it so but there is that competition yeah we don't need to spend a whole lot of extra money we're pretty spoiled these days we have so much great hardware and software yeah yeah totally absolutely so um if you are interested in the ssl native x echo it's currently on an introductory offer um this is uk prices so it's 35 pounds off so it's down to 104 uh, available now from the SSL website. Um, just squeeze a couple of these little ones in, then we're going to come back to Mick, kind of um, see if we can get him to play a little bit more for us, because uh, oh, yeah, we've had some <laughs> we've had some latecomers to the show and they miss some quality stuff. Um, so very quickly, Native Instruments are cel- celebrating 25 years uh, of business, and there is uh, a number of things, but the the two main things, I guess, are uh the uh the controllers that they've uh, put out in these very striking all white and all purple uh color schemes which um yeah as well it's up to you if you like I, i'm neither here nor there really but yeah there's uh, you you can buy uh a machina there's complete control uh, tractor control, all available in these kind of purple and white. And I'm not quite sure. I didn't investigate the relevance of the colours. If that had something uh, to do with anything, I don't know whether it's just the colour scheme they chose. But the other thing that is um, available for this 25 uh, years anniversary is a free plugin, or it's a free library, should I say, for um, contact. So if you are a contact user, you can take advantage of this. Um, and I've lost the page. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. I actually had a play with this before we came uh, on air. Um, this is it's called Twenty Five, and it's it kind of takes on the the, the same kind of format as uh, a number of their libraries have, where you've got these two layers that you can then blend and mix between. There's some really interesting sounds on this, and it's free, so you can't really sniff at it. Um, did anybody else have a little play with this one in contact at all? I, I did download it, but I haven't, I haven't had a chance to have a mess about and it. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> We've been waiting all evening for that. I downloaded it, but I haven't used it, and you didn't yeah. disappoint. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, I can say listen, Charles, I'm, so, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to have to split in a minute. I can see my kids have showed up and they're looking. Oh. Right. No We're looking worries. for father's attention here. Oh, uh, I see. Right. <laughs> no problem. It's, it's no, no. really my mistake because I thought we would run into about nine o'clock, but it's obviously yeah. it's it just much gone. Than yeah, that. it's just yeah. gone. No, no. All right. Well, let's um, let, let's let's make sure we can say goodbye properly. You don't have to run away. Um, Mick, it's been an absolute pleasure having you again, and you must no, come. Been you must come back again soon. Um, Definitely. For those people that started or joined us a little bit later on, when we finished go back uh, to like the mm. first like half I'll, hour I'll of the show. I'll go back and check out the stereo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have a listen. Great. <laughs> Mick treated us to some classics and some new stuff as well, um, playing on his studio there. And it was just, I could have just, yeah, switched off and watched that for the rest of the night. So um, please go back and have a look. Um, yeah, but we'll, thank we'll you again, again for coming on, Mick. And, um, Definitely. Do it again for sure. Uh, <laughs> <Brilliant. laughs> Thank you uh, so much for joining us. Um, we will see you uh, hopefully very soon. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, brilliant mate. to meet you, Chris. It's good to yep. see you again. And Ben, man, it's really cool. Really loved it. Fantastic. Nice one. Take oh, care, Mick. Right. Thank see you. See you soon. Right. Thank you. Right. Bye bye. And there we go. He's going to let me t- turn that off for him. Remove from the stream. There we go. Right. Oh, what a gent. What a star, what a superstar. Um, Yeah, we have uh, slightly run over, but yeah, we uh, we might as well finish up what we've got here. Um, So we were just talking about Native Instruments' 25th anniversary, which, yeah, when you think about it, 25 years, that's a long time in in the software industry because, Mm -hmm. you know, the software, particularly the industry as we know it, that's a a pretty significant milestone in their history. And they, they have been... Whether you like them or not, they've been at the forefront um, of that for pretty much most of that 25 years. What was your first That's native again... instrument? Instrument. Who? Me? Anyone? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I've tried a few of them. Um, I, I usually 
don't really get on with them that well. The the mm. one thing that has stuck with me is battery. I just think yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of that's like the battery. best software drum machine without by a, a mile. You know, the, it's just so easy to use. It's great. All the others don't come anywhere near it. Mm. But I've tried other things and. Uh, I've recently got contact, uh, yeah, the, me too. The, the, the full one. So uh, I'm getting into that a little bit. Um, but, but all these like FM sevens and stuff like that, I didn't really, I, I didn't really, well, I wasn't that impressed with it. But oh, and I had mm. machine as well, or machine, whatever it. Yeah, uh, I, I had the one of those, the big one, and mm -hmm. I had high hopes for that because I thought it was just going to be like battery in a you know, right. a, a unit, uh, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have battery, but in a, a sort of breakout unit, and I can do everything on that without having to faff around with the computer, but I didn't like the way it worked. I didn't like the concept of a, a, another kind of little door in, within your door. Mm. Uh, I thought it was mm -hmm. all a bit weird, that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, good, good on them for being in the industry for so yeah. long, and... And continuously innovating as well. They always seem to be moving forward. They don't seem like some companies just seem to rest on the laurels a little bit, don't they? And uh, and mm. don't push things forward. But they they did that standalone machine, a um, machine of plus, which I thought that was well. It was purely to compete with the MPC stuff, mm. but it was still a good move. Yeah. So yeah, it, good on them. What about you, Chris? Have you uh, are you a big native yeah, instrument guy? I didn't have any of their stuff other than I think I at one point had grabbed their whatever their free little stuff is, the player and whatnot. And they yeah. give you like just pittance as far as free sounds. Uh, and so I wasn't too impressed with that. And I put it off for a long time. But there were some of the newer instruments that I was interested in. So if you know anybody is looking into the ecosystem, if you do the research, you can figure out ways to get it way, way, way cheaper. Oh, yeah. And there's certain things that you do it in a certain order and, and you end up getting it for a lot, lot less. Yeah. Uh, so I finally did that over the summer. And, uh, you know, like Ben, their interface is absolutely awful. I hate it. And and yeah. that probably puts me off of using it more. Um, I I just don't care for it. No, but no. Some, of, some of the instruments are worth, like, you know, kind of dealing with the hassle of it i mean everything uh in their their contact player um is is you know like small looks like it's from windows 95 kind of stuff yep. and it's just not a good experience but when you actually get into the gui the, of their plugins it's not too bad and um you know some of their stuff that has come out lately like the uh ash light and far light and that whole series whatever three or four mm. of them there are um, I've been using those a lot more and more for ambient stuff, uh, like kind of darker, darker sounds. And, uh, I've enjoyed that as well as, uh, massive X, but there always seems to be something that's kind of missing in mm -hmm. their, their interfaces. And like the massive X pre, uh, preset system is kind of, uh, let's say it needs some work <laughs> much like the <laughs> jd 800 uh, yeah. you know as well yeah. so there's always something to deal with they, they end up making their plugins a little more of a hassle to use and i wish they didn't um you know we were talking about falcon the other week and i feel like they've probably got a better handle on that whole like bringing everything into one one mm. yeah you know piece of software so yeah, Glad that sure. they've been around for that long. And, I, you yeah. know, so another company, I, IK Multimedia, which, of course, Rob, you do a lot of work yeah. with, um, has probably been, yeah, has been yeah. around a long time. Remember that Amplitude 2 was probably some of the first third-party software that I ever used. Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. to see that so much time has passed for these these companies. And I, I do hope that they'll continue to, to try to make great instruments and maybe – you know, native would consider like redoing the whole interface of their system. Yeah, I mean, it do, it does. I, I have often said how I resisted and resisted, and it was only this year that I got contact the full version of contact. Yeah. I, you know, I got the players and stuff, and yeah, you, know, you could only do so much with those things. But I remember, you know, back in the day, um, it was you know, native instrument stuff was the stuff to have because. There weren't many other people out there doing yeah. really good software instruments. So, you know, 
James Dyson in the chat mentioned Pro 52 or Pro 53 or whatever it was. Or was it 52 and then 53? I can't remember. But there was the Profit, it was a Profit 5 clone. And there was also FM7, which was the DX7 clone. And that there was like four or five instruments at the time that, you know, those were the ones to have. Everybody mm-hmm. wanted uh, those instruments. And I remember, you know, Contact um, was incredibly popular, mainly because it was incredibly easy to get hold of without paying for it, if you know what I mean. And I, again, I was having a discussion earlier this week, and, and I've always kind of been of the belief that native instruments and I might be completely off the mark here, so this is just my assumption, but it it never struck me that they pushed back hard on the fact that you could get a copy of Contact without paying for it very, very easily. And I just wondered whether the concept there was that if we get our platform out to as many people, we will make the money on the library content. We will make the money on the add-ons. And if people really want it, they'll eventually pay for it. And I remember doing stuff with Steve Howell at Hollow Sun, and and he would get requests by the bucket load. Can you please transfer your stuff from Akai to Native Instruments because nobody's Mm -hmm. using hardware anymore? And he resisted right to the bitter end, and then um, eventually he had to go over because he he wasn't going to sell anything. And so he went over and he got a, a guy in from Croatia, I think, to do the scripted front ends and Steve just carried on doing the sampling but just moved into that world and he always said to me that it was just like I it was the the bitter pill that I had to swallow if I wanted to still sell stuff to uh, a marketplace that would buy it and nobody was buying Akai stuff anymore so it had to go yeah. over to there and I just wonder if that was their plan all along was market dominance through the platform yeah. and if people could get, you know, a cracked copy of, of Contact, then so be it. But we'd make our money on the licensing and the and the libraries. It could have been, and you know, one of the, one of the reasons that it, that I ended up getting it after all was just for that reason. They're ubiquitous, yeah. and when you try to find stuff on different, like, uh, so one of the examples that I have, in fact, last night a friend of mine sent me the video where. Um, Christian Hinson is showing off what's that uh, gigantic synth that he just got? I can't remember what. Colossus, Colossus. yes. Yeah. Um, and so he did a sample set for that, which he put up on Piano Book. And if anybody doesn't know, Piano Book is a, is a great website yes, where yeah. people share their sample sets. It's all free. And there's multi-platform stuff, but it really depends on the person making it. And so, you know, one of one of the sad things for me is before I got contact, and even afterwards, is that most of the stuff is made for contact. Now, mm-hmm. some of the some of them on there have made it for other formats, including Logic Sampler. And I'd always will take it for Logic Sampler first if I can do it because it's so much easier to work in that yeah. than it is in contact. Um, but you know, when when you can only find it in one format, that gets to be the issue. And I know you you've mentioned quite a few times how you wish uh, UVI would make their platform a little more <laughs> ubiquitous. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, I, when I compare the two, it's chalk and cheese in my opinion. That UVI have got a much nicer interface. I cannot, I couldn't believe when I bought contact and like you said you you made a very good point that buying into the ni ecosystem is if you if you plan it carefully you can get into it at a really good price point Mm -hmm. and if you get one thing then that kind of entitles you to a little bit extra discount here and has a kind of a knock-on effect and that's exactly what i did and i think i can't remember i picked it up for about a hundred bucks which is you know i don't think i I don't think i was ever going to get it that cheap again so i thought yeah I, I need it because people are sending yeah. me stuff, so I've got to yeah. have it. Um, and when I loaded it up, I thought, my God, they still have this awful user <laughs> interface. Yeah. And the fact that when I call some of, uh, on the left-hand side, that left-hand column where you have your library, so when you install a native instruments contact library, it will kind of live permanently in that left-hand uh, pane. But if you've got other instruments that maybe other people who've you know created, like the Hollow Sun stuff or others, mm-hmm. you can go off and and find it and load it up. But then the next time you load Contact up, it's not in there. You have to go off and find it and load it again. And somebody did tell me you can create, you can kind of work around that. But it's it's a bit of a faff. Whereas, like whenever you install a, a library into Falcon or, or UVI Workstation, once it's there, it's there, and you can just go and and pick it up, and it's. Yeah. 
I just, yeah, I couldn't get over the fact that it was just still that awful, awful interface that didn't yeah. look much different to what it did maybe sort of 20 years ago, which is crazy. You know, there's uh, something that we covered called uh, Atlas. And, uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember what he's called. And then also XLNXO, which are, are drum-specific pieces mm -hmm. of software. But, you know, it's, it's nice when they're we can find stuff that will work in multiple systems. And so with like yeah. Atlas or um, XO, XO is the one I kind of prefer to use right now. I have directed it towards all the samples that are on my computer. It's kind of collected it. And then in one interface, I pull up this one plugin and I have access to every drum sound that I have on there. Mm. So long as they didn't make it in some sort of, um, file type that's not readable, you know, by yeah. other software, but you know, all the WAV files and everything, like it just sees it, it brings it all into to one system. I only have to use one uh, plugin and then and I have all this different stuff. And I guess, you know, people that have really not just bought in, like they paid money for the contact uh, system, but you know, people that have really got into it full, complete everything that that's their main thing that they use within their DAW. I mean, I mean, I guess you could make that work. I just don't like that system. It's such an ugly, hard to use interface that I just can't see myself making that a yeah. priority. No, no, it's. Uh, I'm I'm glad that I stuck with stuck to my guns and say I've I've got contact now at a, a dirt cheap price and it's there when I need it, which mm -hmm. isn't very often. But you know, it's one of the kind of necessary yeah. evils. Ben, you've been pretty quiet on the contact subject. Sorry to wake you. Um, uh, yeah, it's all right. It's you know, you know, it's not it's not great, but I mean the 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 model obviously works because yeah. this is what Spectrosonics are I think trying to do now with Omnisphere. It it it, it gives a whole new avenue of sales and yeah, you know, partnerships and it it makes its own little ecosystem within within your door, doesn't it? And and opens up a lot of Possibilities. I, I think that the uh, the initial release on those Sonic extension things it yeah. aren't, aren't aren't mind blowing, but I reckon the stuff that might come out if they do open it up to like third parties and that it will be. I think sign of things some, to come, maybe. Yeah, I think yeah. It, it, it's got great potential, especially if you use that. Imagine something like that. Uh, I don't know. One of the big contact libraries. Uh, on, on Omnisphere with that hardware integration as yeah, well that Omnisphere's yeah. got mm -hmm. in it that yeah. that'd be great. Do, so, do you do you think that Omnisphere, if if that is the way that they're going, they're going to instead of because Om, Omnisphere itself as a standalone product, uh, if you download everything, is huge. Yeah. Is is a, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of content. Yeah. So do you think now they have thought maybe Omnisphere is the platform will will kind of stop it there? And now everything we want to add, we'll do it at these little little packages and sell them separately. Yeah. Or maybe they'll go down the subscription route at some point. Um, do you think that, that might be the case that they've just kind of decided Omnisphere can't really get much bigger because you know people are just going to? I think. Well, yeah, the thing with Omnisphere is it is that sometimes it, it's a great thing, but sometimes you can't. I, I think it's. It's not. It's not very synthy. It's got some synth stuff in it, but it tends to be more unusual sounds. You know, mm. like people. I don't know. People whacking a, a tin of beans with a, a banana. <laughs> you know, it's, it's things like that. <laughs> uh, and they're, they're great for soundtrack work, but sometimes I wish it had more analogy type of stuff in there because of yeah. the way the thing works itself. It's really intuitive and, and quite nice to use. So I, I tend to not use it much when I'm doing my own stuff because there's not that much call for it. But if they do open it up, then you can kind of make Omnisphere what you want. Uh, you, you know, the, the the Sonic extension things that you buy are just the things that you you'll be using, and mm. I think that you can you can get a much more personalised instrument with, with this potential. Yeah. But that's what that's what contact is, isn't it? Contact yeah. is, is full of people's own preferences. Really, yeah. it'll be yeah. interesting if they do license it out, like con you know, like so native instruments. You know, you you develop a library for for contact. You have to have a license to distribute it to work with contact. Same you, with UVI. You don't, 
I'd be surprised. You don't need it because their their system is open already. There are a lot of sound yeah. designers that are already making sound sets, yeah. and so the sound designer, if they use um, the samples that are already in Omnisphere, it's no problem. They get to use right. them and then sell their sounds for it. So it is sure. really just a sound set. And then if they okay. make new samples for it, it just gets loaded into your library. So, I mean, it's it's better than uh, UVI or um, Contact in that regard okay. because there's no charges for it. You just make the sound right. set and you sell it. And, and probably one of my criticisms of these these new sets is that it's just basically it's two reverb or you know, reverb and a saturator or whatever. It's like two effects and then it's just a, a really expensive sound set. You do get samples with it, but um, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I understand why they did that. I think it, it was probably a wise move and they've been very generous in their free updates for Omnisphere. Yeah. I do think that we'll see an Omnisphere 3 in a, probably a couple of years because yeah. they need to update the interface. It's, it looks old and it, and it could be, it could be designed out, laid out a little bit better. Right. But, uh, you know, to what Ben was saying, like, it, it still has a, a great engine. Um, mm. So for analog sounds, I mean, it's got, like, CS80 waveforms in there. Uh, yeah. uh, and there are a lot of wonderful sounds that you can make with it. You just have to dive in. And it's it's a pretty, it, you know, what, whatever you want to do with it, it's got a lot in there to work with. And, again, it's one <laughs> of those things where if you if you – you know, kind of a desert island type of synth, like it'll do a little bit of everything. It has D50 sounds in there, but it also do CS80. So, I mean, just across the spectrum, it's going to give you a little of everything, and you combine those into your own patches in interesting and unique ways. Mm. Yeah. In fact, I, that's, I guess, why I uh, was a little disappointed with these sound sets that I didn't think they really sounded mm. that great compared to what Omnisphere is capable of. So. Yeah. No, I was say, tell me, because um, I don't have Omnisphere, so I, I'm, I yeah. really don't know a huge amount about it. Is it entirely sample based? No. Or are there software synthesized virtual yeah. engines in there, like virtual analog engines, yeah. and that kind of thing? Yeah, virtual okay, analog, yeah. also yeah. samples. Uh, there's uh, basic granular stuff. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say it's as complex as something like pigments, but like I said, it has a little bit of everything for you to okay. work with. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And, and I, when I saw the hardware integration that they uh, they came up with, you know, some while back, I thought that was that was very cool. Um, you know, because the, yeah, if you've got a favorite hardware synth and you want to use Omnisphere as well, well, you know, it kind of makes sense. It's a very clever thing to do. But it um, works. It works really well with the yeah. Well, with these two, with the yeah. Prophet Six and the Sub Thirty Seven. Yeah. And they're always adding spot to on. that list, aren't they, yeah. as well? So, right. I don't know, maybe yeah, one were... day, if I have a bit of disposable income and there isn't anything on my shopping list, you know, then maybe I will. But I kind of think yeah. that I've, I've, I went all in with UVI and I'm, yeah. I'm really, really happy with, you know, with that, you know, and the, what Falcon can do. And I think it's probably comparable in many ways. And if you have both, yeah. it might be overkill. Well, and that's what that's what I was thinking too. I, I I like the sound engine of of Omnisphere a little better uh, compared to the UVI stuff that I have. But the UVI mm -hmm. stuff sounds great, and it's probably got a wider range of of different sounds to go in there. Um, and so it's they're they're both so good that yeah, if you have one or the other, stick with it. There's no yeah. there's no need to go to the other one if you have it. And no. That's why, I mean, every time Falcon comes up for sale, I take a look at it, and, and yeah. you know, you're always talking about it, and I'm like, ah, yeah, it sounds good, and I would love to use it and check it out, but it's like, I don't need it. Yeah. It, yeah. I, and, it, and it would be the same if I was on your side of things, too. Like, if I had Falcon and I was looking at Omnisphere, like... <laughs> I don't. Better, better things to spend the money on absolutely no i agree well it's funny because we're talking about omnisphere and we've talked about uvi and we've talked about contact but of course there is another software sampler out there that dates back way way back and i remember when this first came out and this makes me feel old uh, and that is halion which of mm. course is steinberg's software sampler and i remember uh checking it out very early on and just disliking it and then the other day this popped into my inbox um and this is a new free instrument from steinberg that works within the halion environment and you can actually get halion se i think it is which is a free version so it doesn't have all the bells and whistles on 
Um, and this is a really nice little um, piano based plugin uh, for both Mac and Windows. And you just download uh, the, the Halion Sonic SE 3 uh, to give it its full name uh, to be able to play it. And some really, really very nice sounds. A really nice and simple, very clean, uncluttered uh, interface in there. Um, and it's basically an upright piano that's been sampled um, in there. It has a very kind of very soft, distinct kind of character to it. Um, I had a little play with this, um, but the, I was again I, I, when I got Halley on. I must admit the the installation process for for all of this it's, to get you had to download. It tells you to download the plugin and to download Halley on. So I downloaded both. I installed Halion SE first, which seemed to go without a hitch. Then I downloaded uh, the the what I thought was the the instrument, but actually it's an installer. And you you install the installer, and then you register. You have to register your code that you get in a separate email in your e licenser software. So you have to go. You have to open up your e licenser program. Uh, which references your you know your USB key and you put in the code and that adds it to your licenses and then you have to synchronize those then you have to go off to this software manager and it will appear there and then you can download it and it will install it and then I found that it wasn't working with the version of Halion SE that I had been told to download from the Steinberg website I had to go and do an update so after about half an hour or 45 minutes i eventually got to use this damn thing and i couldn't really complain although i just have um because it's free uh, but it is i mean <laughs> it just seemed like such a massively convoluted horrible way of doing things and to add insult to uh, to injury halley on itself I just had that contact moment. I thought, oh my God, it still looks awful compared to everything else that's out there. I, it's just ugh, horrible. I, I mean, that's it, a common problem with all the Steinberg instruments. I think mm. they all look awful. It's like, they, they, I think they should just forget <laughs> that they do that. Just stick with Cubase and Wave Lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, they, they just, or, or, or they need to. Imp it, employ me and Axel Hartman to sort them all out, I think. Yeah, you and Axel. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's have a quick listen to this, because it does... Once I got past all of that, it it did actually sound quite nice. Hopefully you've got volume on this one. It's very quiet to start with. It's a really nice kind of upright piano that's been multi-sampled and it sounds really nice. But the first thing, the first thing that came into my head was Spitfire Labs. Yeah. There's something like this better yeah. and so much easier to install and use yeah. <laughs> in, Spit, in, in, in Labs, which, of course, they've just added an electric guitar library uh, just the other day. Uh, so there's another one. Yeah. So if you, if you are into Spitfire Labs and you didn't get that email, go and download that now. Um, but... I just thought for all of that hassle, I've now installed two new applications onto my mm -hmm. machine, one of which is just an installer. The other one is an instrument whose interface is horrible just to get this thing. And I just think, nah, I'm, so, not, I'm not getting bothered. Do you think they've done this? Going back to what you said earlier, do you think they have done this to get you into their ecosystem now? <laughs> Yeah, you've gone you know, through all the hassle of it. Yeah, almost certainly, absolutely. And I just thought, well, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, we're going to be talking. And so I, I, you know, I'm committed to this. You know, group. unlike you two, I download it and I use it and play with it and install it. And but no, I mean, it, it just, I mean, I'm, I will be quite happy to just take this off and, and completely remove it um, because I don't think there's anything about this that is redeeming in any way it sounds lovely but i think i've got all of those sounds covered it well I, i've i've already got hallion and I, I do use it quite a bit actually uh hallion yeah. sonic well not so much hallion sonic but hallion sonic is like the the workstation version of hallion hallion is the the sampler and hallion yeah. sonic is the 
kind of lighter workstation version. Yeah, yeah. Version. And I, I've got I've got all of those. Uh, I don't really use Halion Sonic much, but I do use Halion. And I downloaded, I already had the Steinberg uh, software manager or whatever it's called installed because of my Cubase and everything. Mm-hmm. So I downloaded the thing that was showing up in in the thing uh, in the in the list, and then went went to me Alien Sonic, and it wasn't there in the thingy, so I never got yeah. to try it. So even when you are in the ecosystem, <laughs> you can't get access. <laughs> I'm properly in it. I'm in it with both feet, and, and I couldn't get it. Well, that was another thing about the the installer that I've now got on my system. That like every Steinberg piece of software is is like listed there, and you click on it, and it'll download it. Yeah, you can use them. Yeah, but you have to obviously get you know a license to use them or pay to whatever. Um, I think most of them will give you a month. Okay, yeah, right. you can just but, run Riot in there. But it doesn't yeah. it doesn't doesn't make that kind of clear. Except when yeah. you're old and cynical, you know what this is. This is oh look, you've got all of this stuff here. Click, click, yeah, click, yeah, click, yeah, click, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the hope that you know at least one or yeah. two of them might stick and you might like them. But it, yeah. it was just so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Can we, can we uh, uh, title this uh, when you when we chapter the YouTube video? Can we title this one Three old guys uh, <laughs> tell people to get off their lawn." Yeah, get off my sampler lawn. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, look, at the end of the day, it's like digital audio workstations. Some you love, some you hate. There is one. There's going to be one out there that suits your modus operandi, yeah. and it suits the way that your brain is wired. And for me, you know, I have my favorite, you have yours, we all have our own. And, you know, at least we can try it for free and we know we've made a mistake without committing finance to it. I don't think I found like a a proper sampler software one that I like using as much as the hardware ones. Mm. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. There's like none that, like, there's none that can compete with the Akai S6000. That is just great to use. Mm. Uh, And I wish that somebody would. Instead of make, trying to make it a modern thing, just recreate the old way of working in in, in software. You know, well, that, virtually that all of these, you know, Falcon and uh, Halion and uh, Contact, they're not samplers in the yeah. traditional sense yeah. of the word. Yeah. They're sample Sam- playback machines. Sample players, yeah. And that's all they really are. And they're very elaborate and very powerful. Don't get me wrong. You can throw a piece of audio into this. But yeah. it's nothing, yeah, again, you know, to kind of double down on the old man on his lawn thing, nothing can beat plugging something into an Akai or an Emu or whatever it was, hitting record, press play, boom, in you go, and uh, you get you get the sonic character from the, the minute the audio goes into the machine because it's going through processes the second it goes in. Whereas with something like Contact... You know, you, you, you rip a piece of audio from, uh, you know, wherever, and it's more than likely going to be digital. And then just, you know, it's you're just processing it out, whereas the, the whole cycle of things, yeah. and, you know, it's just, it's, I, I love I love doing that, but don't do as much as, as, as I used to. Mm. Uh, yeah. Glenn just uh, popped up in there. Uh, where is it? Uh, I lost it. Uh, there you go. Yeah, S six thousand. Steve Howell product. Yes, indeed, it was. Um, <laughs> he designed the interfaces. He pretty much did all the libraries, and that's how I got connected with with Steve Howell by top um, bloke. Top yeah, bloke well, because it's a cracking system. That oh Still yeah, not been beaten as far as I'm concerned. Well, they went from the S six thousand to the Z series. Yeah. And it was a massive step backwards. And there were lots yeah. of reasons why they did that. The, the fact that Akai Professional in Japan were flagging. You know, there was the onset of the software sampler and there was the fact that people just didn't want to buy big, expensive hardware uh, samplers yeah. anymore when you could get, you know, something for a couple of hundred bucks or something. Um, and when they brought out the Z4 and the Z8, I mean, both Steve and I were just like, oh, what are they doing? This is not good. They're going backwards. And Steve shared with me, and I think I might have shared this in the group, he shared with me his GUI design for the S7000. Ah. And he did it all and uh, front and back, uh, the whole um, user interface design that he did for the S7000 that got ultimately got rejected because they wanted to cut costs and, you know, yeah. reduce things in size and 
they were all about getting 24-bit samples because that's what you could have on you know a contact uh, system and so it was just yeah it was it was a real real shame but yeah s6000 how i got in with him and uh, yeah a long and fruitful partnership which sadly, have, you, have you still got those s7000 things i might have yes Oh, I'd love to see I, those. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I probably won't get into trouble with sharing them now because that Akai doesn't exist anymore. You know, yeah. it all got, it all went under and got bought up um, by what is now in music. Um, but yeah, I mean, to, you know, that that that, that whole kind of uh, era of hardware sampling is was just amazing. And you know, it wasn't just Akai, of course. It was Emu. Um, they, you know, they carried on with their rat mounted samplers back in the day. And actually, the Emulator X. Did anybody? Did either of you ever use Emulator X? I, th- uh, I think that that, that was, was like a, a, a creative audio thing, wasn't it? Yeah. So it was after Creative Labs took over, yeah. and you you could buy um, Emulator X, which was the software, but it was a software um, that behaved as the hardware in many ways. It's kind of tried to kind of bridge the gap. And it went through like two or three revisions. Uh, the first one or two, you had to have a piece of emu or stroke creative audio hardware to act as a, a dongle. Mm. And then by the time they got to Emulator X3, it was like a challenge response thing, I think. And they dropped the whole dongle thing. But by that time, it was too late and creative just like kind of imploded. It didn't really yeah. go anywhere. Uh, Glenn's just reminded me in the chat also that Akai um, did actually have a what they called the VZ8, which was their virtual Z8 sampler. Um, oh, right. So Axis was the software controller for the S6000, which of course yeah. you know is kind of abandoned. Where, but they did have the the VZ8, and I think I've got some screenshots of that. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure at one point I had a beta version somewhere. It's probably a- Access, sitting on the a- Axis. Just looked exactly like what was on yeah. the screen, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, I thought that was great. And I still it was dead I have slow it. though. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't the, the the best of things, but I still have access running on a VM. So I've got parallels on this Mac, and I have uh, a Windows XP and a Windows 10 uh, installation, and I can run access access kind of it's almost natively, you know. But obviously, Windows is running in the background, but I have that connected still to my S6000 just purely for a nostalgia hit because yeah, it is yeah. such a pain in the ass to. Uh, I haven't got a nowadays. USB card in this one. I did in the last. Uh, that, this is the second S6000 I've had. I sold the first one and instantly regretted it and got another one. But it didn't have the card in it. And they're like rocking horse, dung, like you never see them at all. Yeah. Well, um, the USB card now is pointless. Because, oh, is it? yeah, is, is that because the only thing that the USB card did was allow you access to access. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it, it would not show up as a, uh, uh, like a, an external hard drive or anything. But yeah. there is a way around it. And there's a video on my channel um, that maybe I'll uh, rebrand and throw up on the PSM thing. So if you buy a SCSI to SD card... I've got for, one. Yeah, so if you buy one of those, it has to be the version 6. Anything before version 6 won't do it. So if it's a version 6 SCSI to SD card, what you can do is you connect um, a USB cable from the front of that panel, because you normally use it for configuration. But if yeah. you connect a USB cable from that... To your Mac or PC, the SCSI to SD card, the drive that you've got on there, which is formatted in the uh, FAT32, I think, or FAT16, FAT32, will show up as a drive on your computer. And you can drag and drop samples from your desktop into your Akai's drive, even while the Akai is still operating and has that drive mounted in its own system. That's a game changer, that. Uh, do you know the amount of emails and private messages I get from people that have watched that video? It says, "Oh, I want to do that to my S five thousand and my six thousand yeah. And I just, I don't, just, I, yeah. I don't know what version's in mine. Uh, it's the big SD card, though. You you got them with those micro things at first. Yeah, they, they did. They did two versions: one with the full size SD and one with the micro SD. As long oh, as right. the card, the actual board yeah. itself, is version six or above, yeah. then you can um, you can mount the drive in the Akai. And then connect the USB port to the thing and both systems access it at the same time. And so if you've got a bunch of samples on your desktop and you want to access them in the sampler, you just drag and drop the folder into the SD card drive as it appears on your desktop. And you know, within seconds, they're available in oh, your that, S6000. 
That's all I would have used Axis for anyway. Exactly, yeah. I mean, yeah. So. we used Axis a, a lot to do editing because it had that expanded yeah. editing screen, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, but it was still a bit fiddly, but it was nice to use. But yeah, yeah um, if you if you have any of those things uh, and you're using uh, uh, version 6, and I don't, it's not just exclusively for Akai S5000 and 6000s, anything that you can mount that drive on. So uh, I know that um, BT... The, the musician, not telecommunications company. Um, he has, I think Andre fitted a version 6 SCSI to SD drive on his Fairlight Series 3, and so he can drag and drop samples that he's created elsewhere, and they will then dump into the, the drive on the on the Fairlight, and he can then access them and manip manipulate them in there. So it's really cool stuff. And, mm. yeah. Uh, that, so I'll... Speaking of Fairlights, right. Yeah. Somebody in the chat before mentioned when I was going on about trackers. Mm. I'm sure somebody in the chat said that the page R on the Furlight is kind of a tracker. Not really, isn't it? It's no, it's it's a it's a linear. Um, I might have got it wrong. I might have yeah. got cross wires on that. No, page page R was just like eight tracks of monophonic, and you just dropped the notes on, and that you just told it, you know, what length the notes were, or you know, whatever. Sounds um, a bit right, though. Yeah, but um, <laughs> Andrew says, "Ooh, Fairlight, here we go." Funny, <laughs> do you know, it's funny because um, we're just kind of rambling here. Um, I'm going up to the National Science and Media Museum again in November. So, if anybody wants to come along to a sampling stroke Fairlight uh, workshop event, uh, it's all being run at the end of November in Bradford. Um, and they I'm allow you take... to stroke Fairlights there. Well. This is, that this, what is said? this is this is this is the funny thing. This is the funny thing. They have Robin Scott's series three. Now Robin Scott is better known as M, who had a great hit single called Pop Music back in the day, and um, he donated his series three to the museum. And we did a workshop there a couple of years ago. And Robin comes along, and so the muse museum have got his series three out there. And, and I walk into the room and see a Fairlight. So naturally, I gravitate to the thing, and I want to look inside it, see what it's got, what it hasn't got. I put my finger on it, and this voice from the back of the room says, "Get your hands off of that! Don't you dare touch that without any gloves on, without permission." I was like, only what? there having me dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway. I just stepped back and she said, no, you mustn't touch it. It's a museum piece and therefore blah, blah, blah. I said, have you powered it up? Oh, no, 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 no. You can't power it up because you have to get signing, you know, permission from that person, signed off by that department. Oh, bloody hell. Anyway, um, long story short, they contacted me um, the other week and said, uh, Rob, is there any chance you can bring a working Fairlight to this thing? And I'm like, you've got one. You've got a famous one, a really good one as well. And they want me to take a Fairlight uh, all the way up to Bradford. So I've had to be getting quotes of, you know, vans and insurance. How much do you think it costs to insure a, a fully maxed out Series 3 in mint condition to take up to Bradford for three days? 13 quid. You're not far off, actually. <laughs> really? Oh. 55. <laughs> I was being facetious. I thought no, no. he was going to say like twenty-two grand or something. No, fifty-five quid for three days. All right. Yeah, wow, and that's, that's, that's not bad. Yeah. That's, so um, yeah, it's uh, well, that's that's the basic. So if I, I want to add in you know, a few other bits, it'll probably go up from there. But uh, uh, yeah, I when, mean, it's just, when is that, Rob? Uh, it's November twenty-seventh, I believe, at Ooh. the National Science and Media Museum. It's a Saturday in Bradford. Uh, it's part of the the Science Museum. Oh. In you know. It's based in London. Um, and, yeah, there'll be myself, uh, Robin Scott, um, Manuela, Dr. Manuela Blackburn, who used to be at uh, Keele University and is very familiar with the Fairlight that they've got there and is a, a composer in their own right, and we must get her on the show. And um, he's going to kill me now because I've completely forgotten his name. But there's another guy from Edinburgh. Just, just move um, your mouth, right? Just call it R. Uh, and, and then dub it in. It with, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dub it in. Yeah. Yeah. This, is why you, this is why you are where you are and why I am where I am. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, his name will come to He's written a really good book about digital sampling. He's got, somebody will put it in the chat room. I know Chris Blythe will probably throw it in there. But anyway, um, so yeah, we're all going to do this thing and we'll be using uh, hopefully my, or what, not my fellow, like, but the fellow I have here and um, the iPad app and, and probably Quasar Beach as well, which is the free application that... Um, Jean-Luc has made 
Uh, but there you go. Yeah, so yeah, we've got a bit of Fairlight in there as well, which would be fun. So if you want to see a Series 3 working, come along to the workshop, um, National I, Science and Media Museum. I'd come up to that, but I don't think I'll get back quick enough for the gig. Oh, right. Because I will well, have I, a gig on that day. I don't know what time it starts. I think it's like an all-day kind of yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good fun. Um, the last time we did it, we had a good bunch of people in there. We sent them all off with iPads with the, the Fairlight app on and said, go out into the wild, go around the museum and sample stuff and then make a piece out of it and so that's yeah. what they did and they went out and there's the, some really inventive people you know they went into the toilets and were banging the bowls and rubbing pencils across the radiators and um jamie morden was there from gsnc he turned up and showed up so oh, yeah right. it was uh, it was a good old uh, good old event so yeah hopefully we're we're gonna do a little you know something a little bit different this time but there hopefully will be a fully operational fairlight oh it's Touch worth wood. going for that yeah and then I'll show you how I don't really know how to use one. So uh, lovely, yeah. Anyway, um, we've <laughs> we've rambled on as yeah. uh, Led Zeppelin once said. Mm. I, heard, I heard that in a movie trailer the other day. I thought, Archer, oh, that is such a great song, isn't it? I love that. You know, I I, I love Jimmy Page. Yeah, but man. John Paul Jones kicks some serious butt. Man, that bass yeah. line and ramble on. Superb, isn't it? Absolutely superb. Love a bit of Zeppelin. Anyway, guys, it's been a fantastic show. I can't believe mm. we, we got Mick on and he played those riffs live on the show. It was, no, just, that, was that was just incredible, that. It was as yeah. good as the recording. I mean, it sounded to me like he'd just pressed play on his MP3 player, but yeah. no, he was actually playing it. We had evidence. It was, uh, yeah, what a, what a dude. And, and, and those, like learning that like waterfront was created from technical restrictions rather than yeah. uh, a conscious effort to make a song just on one note yeah it, 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 that that wouldn't happen now there's no, no limitations now really and i think that's half the problem yeah. or maybe more than half the problem with music these days yeah but there you go um who have we got coming up um did we get confirmation about next week's guest? Is that definitely going to be okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's good fine. stuff. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. <laughs> so, next week, we definitely, definitely do have uh, this guy. we yes. got Tim Dorney uh, of Republica. Um, Republica have been out touring just lately. Um, so, nice. yeah, lots, lots of questions for Tim uh, and his use of synthesizers, uh, both in the studio and live. And then the following week, this is going to be a blast. And what I suggest... Uh, given my conversation with Mike um, on Tuesday, which went on for over four hours, this might be one where you need to bring beverages, a blanket, maybe a pillow, just to settle in there nicely because we could go on for a very long time because Mike is just full of information and anecdotes and stories and he's like... I don't know what he's on, but I want some because he's just like, you know, <laughs> just just a ball of energy. Um, a fantastic, really, really interesting guy. And, of course, um, as you can see in the the image there, he's the author of this wonderful yes. book, Synth Gems 1, which is out now and is bloody brilliant. It who's really is. Who's that fella who's done the foreword? Can we get him on? Some, some geezer from Basildon. Uh, yeah. Only yeah. Bloomin' Vince Clark. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's done that. But this, if you imagine that all of the greatest, most fantastic, I mean, look at this thing. It's just the, Ooh, the pictures are amazing. Yeah. All of the greatest uh, and fantastic, most fantastic and interesting synthesizers like the yamaha dx1 yeah um if they were all in the same room together Cassio oh Williams. i've got one of them yeah got one of them. this is is one of those books where you you will almost certainly say oh i've got one or a played one of those yeah look at the fair light stuff this is what i help uh mike get hold of um these images from tim curtis of his fair light in la um, ah but, right yeah um I yes, haven't so got one of them obviously the fair lights in there as well yeah. Gorgeous. <laughs> and Mike describes it at the beginning of the book as this is the exhibition catalogue of an exhibition that couldn't ever take place. How thick is it, Rob? Oh, yeah, it's a fairly substantial... Good, an inch that, or yeah, so yeah. deep, yeah, and it's it's beautiful. You know, the paper is beautiful, the quality is that 
Does it smell good? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> oh. It is, it, and it's super, and it's not just something around 60 synthesizers, although there's 47 main chapters. There's about 60 instruments in here. It's not just them and about all the stuff, and I'm really stealing from his show here, but he won't mind. Um, but it's also got information about exactly what a synthesizer is and how a synthesizer works. So if yeah. you're not one of us, this is still a really good book to be able to get into. And at the back, uh, he details all the museums where they went to photograph these things. So you've got loads of information about SMEM and EMI app and Synthorama, loads of links for uh, online resources, ProSynth Network not included. <clears throat> Synth Gems 2, please, Mike. Um, can, we, can we get your commitment? Pull it, pull it. Synth Gems 2 must have a link to ProSynth Network in there. Pull it. Uh, I know where it is. <laughs> I'm just waiting to see if he's uh, responded to that in the... Uh, da, 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 da. Anyway, um, so yeah, please, uh, if you can, go and order that book for, for your loved ones or get your loved ones to buy it for you for Christmas. It's such a good book um so yeah we've got him coming up in a couple of weeks and then after that we've got thomas from cme and not only has thomas uh not promised us but he's told me that he's going to try his best to get some black friday deals especially for people that tune into the show um he, we might also be joined by uh, a friend of his called jasper who's done some amazing videos not just of cme uh stuff but he just does great synth videos and he's a really cool keyboard player um his band's name i think is shock and um yeah so hopefully we're going to be joined by him um and we're going to kick off december with this guy who posted a very odd picture of himself uh you know one of those apps that makes you <laughs> hey, makes you look it. like a woman it. yeah i, I, I think would. we should put I think we should put that photo on there. We'll get more viewers. Yeah. I, I, I added her. I added her. I thought, I yeah, thought yeah. she was quite yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And then um, then we've got, I think, just a couple of weeks. And then we're into Christmas. Um, so we, we're still trying to figure out what we're going to do um, over the Christmas New Year period, whether it'll just be, uh, we'll just put our feet up for two weeks or whether we'll have some sort of... It'll do something. Uh, we'll do something, yeah. Even if it's a pre-record, because um, it could be quite messy. Um, but yeah. anyway... There we go. Great lineup of uh, guests coming on the show. Thank you to everyone that's been in the chat room. Thank you also to anyone that has donated through super chats or stickers. I did see one come through and it's just gone off the thing. Yeah, Wagyu. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, always reliable Wagyu. But thank you ever so much uh, for anybody that donates there. It means so much to us that you enjoy the show enough to give us some money to help us keep doing this stuff. Um, so that's fantastic and of course if you are unable to do that in the live show and you do want to still donate then just down below in the description of the video is a link to our PayPal donations page so yeah if you feel that way inclined yeah please please do don't forget tomorrow afternoon Ramsey's show I'm not sure who's on there I'm sure Andrew and Darren will be on there as per I don't know if there's a specific topic for, for this week, but they kick off at around quarter to two UK time in the afternoon. So whatever that is in your time of the world. And again, if you're watching on catch up, you'll probably be able to watch them on catch up. So do the same there. Uh, and then Sunday, of course, you've got Mr. Wiggly, Dominic Hawken, uh, 7 p.m. on Sunday. Again, I'm not entirely sure uh, who's on this week. Um, he had a great show with Adamski uh, last week and we need to get him on here at some point um Definitely. Yeah. yeah so that's that and then into next week obviously sonic state on the wednesday jamie on the thursday so yeah always something good gaz williams probably will do something on wednesday evening there's always something good around and uh we just like to make sure that everybody knows it you know that everyone's out there and we we all love each other and uh, support each other's shows hopefully so great stuff Guys, I'm going to have to go because I've run out of drink. My voice is going. I need wine. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thank you, guys. Um, been a brilliant show, as always. I'm going to go back and listen to uh, to Mix uh, Noodlings again yeah. before we go to bed tonight. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. What Have you got anything lined up for the coming days, you two? Anything interesting? More gigs? 
I'm got well. I've got I've got a gig tomorrow. A really good gig at the Leighton uh, Institute in Blackpool again. Blackpool. Uh, but it's a cracking venue. This one. It's really good. I'm really looking forward to it. Plus, it's got its own system in there, so it's nice. less to set up and it's cool. it, it's optimized for the venue. So, really I'm looking forward up. to that one. I'm but I'm also going to be doing a bit more work on uh, me comparison video because I've filmed it oh, all yes. now. Yeah. I just have to edit edit it. It's only short, but it takes you about six hours, mate, like a half an hour video. I, I've been promising this this poly group thing, <laughs> and I, yeah, it's it, it it doesn't it's not easy. But yeah. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have some good content coming up in the the coming weeks. Um, so yeah. Oh, there we go. There's another one from Magoo. Thank oh, you, mate. Lovely. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Magoo. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Much appreciated. How about you, Chris? Anything good lined up? Solar is solar okay, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I've I've got her down over here right now. Okay. So she's had, she's had a good week, and thanks for everybody good. for all the concern. Uh, I've got the living room all in a disaster. Like of <laughs> of my wife and I, I'm the neat freak, and she's like not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll be nice, uh, <laughs> but she's such a wonderful woman, and uh, I I just said like I've been working really hard, and you know you get those little projects that you want to do like a, a you know redoing your studio and so like about twice a year i get on redoing pedal boards so i've got nice. three pedal boards out in the living room that i've been redoing this is would be considered my main one which is kind of cool. the medium and uh you know so you got to do all the rewiring and the rooting of cables and all that oh, kind of yeah. stuff and it's a lot of work and i'm realizing that i'm getting older because i'm sitting on the floor cross-legged doing it i'm like i get up I, oh my yeah. gosh yeah but it's good for the it's good for the mind and uh, <laughs> it's good for good for the mind and the soul and all that stuff uh yeah. you know you're just like just sit and do something that you love indeed absolutely which is why we do this i think uh once mm. a week um anyway listen guys it's been a pleasure as always thank you again to mick mcneil for joining yeah. us for Thanks, two mate. solid hours of of great chat and and information and history and anecdotes we'll have him back again soon i am sure we won't leave it as long uh this time and of course thanks to everybody in the chat room uh mm -hmm. and everyone that's watching post live show because i know a lot of you live in parts of the world where it's just an ungodly hour so thank you for coming back to us please please do hit the like button now if you haven't already um do subscribe to us and, and hit the bell to make sure that you get uh, notifications of when we do this stuff again and, and uh, we will a, see you oh yeah uh, just a thank you to everybody that comments on the video even after yeah. you know when they've come back and watched it really yeah. appreciate it you know we go through and and take a yeah. look at all the comments and so even some of the interaction and some of the some of the things that are you know you know help with uh that things that we've been talking about that yeah. people share good information so appreciate it yeah and of course if you if you're watching us here hopefully you're already a member of the facebook group if you're not get over there join the facebook group and if you want to have input mm -hmm. into the show and tell us you know things that we ought to be talking about or people we should be talking to or if you have contacts come and come into the group tell us in there and, and join in it's still probably i still hear this you know and i'm not just saying this because you know, we're part of it but I still get told that it is one of the nicest, um, most pleasant groups to hang out in if you're into all of this stuff because it, there's there's really no abuse and no nastiness. It's all like-minded people doing, you know, and talking about, you know, a shared passion. It's a really cool place to be. So if you're not there already, please go over there and join us. And uh, yeah, um, of course, we're also on Instagram and Twitter. All of the handles are at ProSynth Network. Um, I would put it up on the screen but i can't be bothered because i've got everything lined up for the end of the show so uh yeah at prosynth network we're all over the place um thank you again for joining us we will see you same time same place next week with our very special guest who is tim dorney and uh yeah have a great weekend everyone take care bye bye